you are live now ma'am uh, a very good evening to one and all of you for uh, our arc webinar and this time it's on uh, technologies and techniques to enhance a cornea surgeon and i think as we uh, see the entire program it's going to be very useful and relevant uh, in our day to day practices to be enlightened on this and we're truly lucky to have the, the best of expert panel to guide us Uh, mute everybody. There's a background noise coming, and we're truly lucky to have the best of expert panel and a great set of speakers who are going to take us on for the next two and a half hours with lot of energy and uh, learning. We are lucky to have with us on the expert panel Dr. Namrata Sharma, who's a professor of ophthalmology, specialist in cataract, cornea, and refractive services, and most popularly known to us as a very able honorary secretary of AIRS and. who has done wonders in the last 2 uh, years and uh, and has really made it a very difficult uh, path to follow for her uh, anybody who is going to take on this post in future we are very lucky to have with us dr rajesh fogla who is not just an expert panel in this uh, uh, webinar but has also been very generous and uh, helpful to take on as a co moderator or rather the prime moderator as dr rishi swaroop had some other important issues which came up suddenly and we all know again dr rajesh fogla is a very great presence and in indian and international ophthalmology with a huge clinical experience and surgical experience in uh, anterior segment surgery and uh, i think we are really indebted to him to have his support today we have with us on the expert panel dr mal fernandez who's a network director finance and accounts and also director of lv prasad uh, a center of excellence in hyderabad again another very versatile surgeon who is to join us any time now we have with us as on the expert panel dr radhika tandon who is again a professor of ophthalmology from rp center and she is uh, not just famous for her publications and book chapters and textbooks but is a really a very eminent figure in various ophthalmic associations and again we are very lucky to have us with us we have with us dr rama rajagopal who is a director of refractive surgery shankar netralia chennai and an individual of uh, great reckon and we are truly indebted to her to have her with us and uh, i think without wasting a moment we shall go on to our first speaker oh hello dr mal missed out i didn't realize and very nice to have you joining right on time uh, we shall go on to our first speaker dr mukesh taneja who is uh, again uh, Uh, from LB Prasad I Institute, a uh, senior consultant from Cornea and Anterior Segment Services, and uh, he is going to talk on something very relevant to us: mammography, current use in dry eye diagnostics. On to you, Doctor. Hello, uh, I want to be talking about uh, the bone gland <clears throat> dysfunction today. you Let share your just, screen uh, yeah is it visible now no is it visible is my screen visible now yes 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 it's visible yes Thank you, Doctor Chitra, for giving me this. Sorry, very sorry, very sorry for the wrong introduction. I'm very sorry for that. Uh, so uh, yes, I was at LVPI till about two years ago. Now I am in private practice and uh, have relocated to Delhi, which is my hometown. Uh, so I shall be talking about mammography and its current uh, use in dry eye diagnostic. I uh, would like to thank Doctor Chitra for giving me this uh, opportunity to present in this symposium. Uh, I have no uh, financial interest in the subject matter which we are discussing today. A little bit of history. So uh, Henrik uh, Niebuhr was a professor of medicine uh, in Germany way back in 1666 when he was just about 28 year old. He gave the anatomical description of mammalian glands. He at that time he called them tarsal glands, but we in his honor these are known as mammalian glands. And what he described. Three centuries ago, more than three centuries ago, is uh, has still uh, stood the test of time. We know that there are about twenty-five to forty 
myoglobin glands in the upper lid and about 20 to 30 in the lower lid. These are comprised of uh, various acini which open into a central duct which open into an orifice on the uh, lid margin. Uh, these uh, uh, secrete a sebum or a lipid which provides a smooth optical surface uh, for the cornea and uh, provide the stability of the tear film. Uh, we know that uh, myoglobin gland dysfunction is the major cause. It uh, causes about responsible for about 20 to 40 percent of the dry eye disease that we see in the clinics. Traditionally, uh, we all of us have uh, diagnosed myoglobin gland dysfunction based on the signs uh, in a patient. Uh, these are the plugging or the pouting orifices uh, on the lid margins or the frothy secretions on the lid margin, uh, telangiectasia, inspissated plugs, or the hyperketonization of the uh, orifices. Some of these images have been taken from LVP, and I guess uh, some are uh, from Dr. Merle uh, Fernandez. Um, Mabography earlier used to be done by using a simple trans illuminator, which would just go under the lid, and you will see a faint image, as you can see here, of the membrane glands. Uh, Dr. Taipei in 1977 was the first person who combined a trans illuminator with the infrared imaging device. Uh, he set it up on a slit lamp, and this is uh, uh, what was the first uh, mobography system, I believe. Uh, about a de decade ago, uh, Dr. Pult from Germany and uh, Professor Arita from Japan have done a very significant work in imaging myoglobin gland, uh, and they call it myobography. And this is a simple infrared uh, imaging device which was created by Dr. Pult from uh, Germany. He described uh, what he called a MIBO scale based on the dropout of the myoglobin glands. So uh, degree zero was when there were no dropouts, uh, Degree one was zero to 25% dropout. Degree two was 25 to 50%. And degree three was 50 to 75%. And degree four is more than 75 or to total dropout. Professor uh, Arita combined the, red, uh, the <clears throat> infrared devices with the software. And he devises a system whereby you can get an automated uh, <clears throat> imaging which also would give uh, dropout areas. He calls it MIBO score uh, instead of the MIBO uh, scale. These are some of the images from his paper. These are the normal amoebogen glands, uh, as you can see in a person. This is a person who had a significant uh, dry eye. You can see a very significant dropouts in this image. Uh, this patient had uh, allergic conjunctivitis, and this is an old person who had a significant amoebogen gland dysfunction. And you can see almost a total <coughs> grade <coughs> free uh, uh, on my uh, What you basically have to understand is it's basically any infrared device will give you uh, the images of the myoglobin glands because the sebum, which is there in the glands, it has a property to autofluorescence. So if you use a simple uh, OCT device or an autorefractometer or anything which uses an infrared imaging, you will be able to. Uh, see the myoglobin glands. So this paper described the use of Vicente OCT uh, to visualize uh, the myoglobin glands. And uh, when I was at LVP, we had this Vicente system. So I have used that Vicente system uh, because the CCD camera, it has an imaging system, uh, which is infrared based. So this is uh, the images which I have taken in there. So this is a patient who had a normal uh, eyes, uh, normal glands. And this patient had a dry eye, and you can see a significant dropouts. And this is an image taken on a simple uh, autorefractometer. So even there, the myoglobin glands stand out, as you can see. At present, there are many platform, dry eye platform, which will uh, show, uh, give you automated analysis of the dry eye, which includes the uh, automated interferometry, tear meniscus height. Uh, non-invasive tear film, breakup time, and mimeography. So most popular of these are SPM uh, IDRA from Italy and Oculus from Germany. I had a chance uh, to use uh, IDRA for a significant time when I was in Cambodia uh, last year. So it gives you uh, uh, automated NIBOT, uh, the mimeography in a test report form, which you can actually share with the patient. It gives you a follow-up data, the, all the um, data in the previous images, whether the patient is improving in his dry eyes or not, and it's very useful in a clinic. 
<laughs> talking a bit about the management of mevabin gland dysfunction again uh, traditionally all of us have used uh, lid scrubs hot fermentation uh, use of azithromycin ointment at the lid margins uh, which has uh, worked uh, uh, quite well for the patient however off late there have been some automated devices which gives you the this is a lippy flow uh, which is a automated system of doing a hot fermentation and a lid massage uh, on the patient which is very convenient and many of you probably would be familiar with the ipl which is a intense pulse light treatment which works again uh, very well for the dry eye um, majorly for the mevabin gland disease uh, again i had a chance to use the tixel uh, device which is a thermomechanical device from uh, israel uh, it has a titanium tip which uh, heats up to 400 degrees centigrade and touches the lid just for about 8 milliseconds and uh, it's a very simple uh, to use we just uh, need about 5 minutes for both the eyes so uh, 10 shots are given in two rows to the lower lid and to the upper lid uh, of both the eyes and the patient uh, I have treated, uh, you give uh, three treatment, two weeks apart and uh, I have treated about uh, 50 patients and with almost 80% success uh, rates. I was so impressed with the results that I got it done for my own eyes and uh, uh, with quite a uh, good results. Uh, we saw in these patients, we analyzed the results. Uh, so the o OSDI and the tear osmolarity score significantly improved as well as the nibut uh, after about uh, six weeks of follow-up. And we compared this data with the IPL data and it compares very favorably, rather a little better than IPL. We are, this, these results are under publication and will be soon out uh, for everyone to see. To summarize, in the past uh, decade, we believe that technology has evolved significantly to help us understand, diagnose, and treat MGD and dry eye disease much better than before. Uh, thank you, everyone, for the patient listening. Thank, <clears throat> thanks a lot, Dr. Mukesh, for uh, uh, all that you said, and it was uh, gave us a good uh, insight about this uh, uh, mabography and the need. Uh, but I would... Uh, like to ask uh, two questions before I ask Rajesh to uh, take one. Uh, could I direct this question to Dr. Merl? Dr. Merl, you are there? Dr. Merl is not there. Okay. So any any of the expert panel uh, could uh, take answer this. Now, what system would you prefer to actually grade uh, mebovine gland disease? Because there are different classifications which are there. Does it matter at all to have different classifications? Because is our treatment going to vary uh, based on that? Who is going to take this uh, answer? Dr. Sunita? Dr. Rama? Um, see, essentially here, I think we are not just looking at the grading. I think we're looking at the overall uh, symptoms of the patient starting from other tests as well, including uh, your T-BERT and Schirmer's. Yeah. Mabography is one of the ways of quantifying the disease into mild, moderate, and severe. And most of them have similar gradings of less than 25%, 25-50% or 75%. So I think irrespective of the score, I think if a patient has a mild to moderate form of the disease, these are the patients who will definitely ben benefit with the treatment options that are available. So that means it answers my second question. So which subset of patients would uh, benefit most from intermittent pulse therapies? Uh, would you say that they should be the mild to moderate groups? Because I suppose the advanced group with obliterated glands, it actually makes no sense. Dr. Rajesh? Yes, yes I think uh, the point that you made that if there are no functioning glands, yeah. uh, what are you trying to achieve? You know. Yeah. If the glands have already psychiatrized. Yeah. Unlike uh, sometimes, uh, the, the question I have is for Mukesh only, yeah. that when you are imaging these glands and if you have a lot of tarsal papillae uh, or, you know, uh, how does these affect the imaging? Because there have been instances where after adequate treatment for the allergic conjunctivitis, when the lid condition improves 
and then you do a repeat imaging. Sometimes the gland dropout that you see initially, uh, you know, you you image them much better. So, what has been your experience? Yeah, uh, I have not analyzed in that situation, but uh, in the sense, as I said, basically what you are imaging is the autofluorescence, and if there is a barrier uh, to that uh, imaging, yes, uh, you probably would interpret this as a dropout, which may not be there. But you are very right uh, in the sense when uh, I have not seen the dropouts which were there earlier and after that they have improved. I mean, anatomically, it does not make sense. Uh, so if it is, if you're seeing imaging uh, improves after the treatment, so probably there is something which else is which is going on. And one of the possibilities is that there was a, some fault in the imaging. That is a possibility. There is a, at least one or two papers exist where they have tried to uh, um, basically analyze or synchronize what you see, the signs as well as the images. And they have seen that it uh, corresponds significantly well when you are seeing much of telangiectasia or a plugging and you also see uh, uh, those distortions on the web membrane. So it fails completely. Uh, uh, I mean, it com uh, compares very favorably with the two of things. But what Dr. Chitra said, I agree that uh, to treat a patient who don't really need a mammography, you can treat them even on a physical signs which you see in a patient. But now that I'm in a uh, in a private practice, it becomes a much, uh, I mean, it becomes easy to explain to the patient, okay, this right. is the problem and this is what we are treating. So uh, the patient satisfaction or understanding improves when you're using these imaging devices or also in the grading, or if you're doing some studies, it helps. But otherwise, as far as the managing a patient of MGD is concerned, no, you can very well manage them without mebography. I think that is what Dr. Chitra was trying to say. Would you have a cutoff of the a lipid value below which you would feel that, yes, we could uh, treat these patients? Because otherwise, we, you know, we would be moving on to our next talk with not enough clarity whether it actually does have a major role. Because either we have to follow the follow up these patients again to a mammography and find out whether the glands have improved, which is less likely. So, would there be any cutoff value at least when you would say, or it is just a glorified heat treatment? As far as the treatment is concerned, yes, uh, I would agree. Like. Uh... A, a part of it is the symptomatic relief that the patient gets. So even if, uh, I mean, it is known that probably it has some effect on the nerve at the neurological level and which obliterates the, the pain which is coming from the inflammatory angle, which is obliterated by these treatments. And maybe the movement gland function is not really getting improved. So I would, uh, in a practice, I do not ask the patient to stop uh, the physical or the routine treatment, which is application of the uh, either the steroids or the doxycycline or the azithromycin ointment. I uh, do this concurrently with the uh, conventional treatment. Okay. Dr. Harshwarthan, Harshwarthan, you have anything to add? Yeah, just uh, usually people ask which is better, is IPL better or lipid flow better? Uh, my understanding is uh, that they both complement each other maybe lipid flow as the first treatment and followed by IPL. Uh, maybe uh, Dr. Anaga can answer that. Yeah. Um, can I just make a quick comment? Yes, sure. yes say Anaga. Actually, both lipid flow and uh, uh, it's difficult to have access to both, especially in private practice. Uh, Ma'am, one uh, thing we have observed is when the technician is actually doing the mybography, if there is some glare or you know some shining light on the uh, patient's eye, then sometimes it can be miscalculated. In the SPM, for example, they give you the percentage of meibomian gland loss. So sometimes you have a normal lie, but you can still get it at 100% loss. So you have to just be a little more uh, careful with that. And another thing is, many times we have uh, seen that even these patients, though they have a lot of uh, signs, they may not have symptoms and vice versa. So there could be a lot of disconnect between the symptoms and signs. So I think what we are doing in our place is we are screening those patients who have some symptoms and especially those who have a lot of exposure to computer use and uh, digital use and high uh, risk patients like chronic diabetics and patients who are on chronic anti-glaucoma medications and those who are having symptoms or chronic contact lens users. And many of these patients also show 
uh, signs. So they may not be extremely symptomatic. So I have, we have found a lot of disconnect between the signs and symptoms. Yes, I do believe on that. Any final note, Dr. Rajesh, before we go on to our next speaker? Yes, I agree. There are a lot of uh, treatment options for mebumin gland dysfunction. Lippy flow, I understand the mechanism of treatment. It's basically you are trying to express the glands. Yeah. The remaining, the mode of action is questionable, but yes, they do seem to provide some amount of symptomatic relief, both the IPL and the TICSA. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we shall now go on to our second speaker, Dr. Dipti Mehta, who's a director and consultant of cornea and refractive surgery at Karthik Netralia Bangalore. And she is going to throw light on Corneal tomography, the key indices for refractive screening. On to you, Dr. Bitti. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chitra, ma'am, and ARC for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, so, yeah, I think this is a very important topic for every corneal refractive surgeon as to uh, what are my key indices when I want to do a pre-refractive screening. Because when you are speaking of keratoconus, it's totally different. We are looking at gross numbers, but it's very important to look at uh, early signs of uh, FF cases when you're doing a pre-screening. So, through this talk, I'll just explain uh, the key indices which I look for and it will be mostly on the Pentacam because that's the device we use. And I'll end it with few uh, no, uh, case presentations where probably a few practical tips on reading topography. Now, we know Pentacam is huge. Uh, the, uh, what we max give is a printout to a patient, but there's so much more you can explore and do. But I think two important prints is what the patient usually carries out. One would be the quad map and the other would be the PAD scoring if you have the HR. So before interpretation, I think for any uh, 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 scan you do, you will have to mentally divide uh, into not missing or uh, looking at any things to look at in the pentacam and when in a busy open justice line value there so this is the first thing generally uh, we look of uh, any tomographies you can see the back surface of the cornea so these are the numbers to remember i won't go into the technique of anything it's just going to be the figures and um, anterior elevation you need to ensure it is lesser than 15 and in the posterior it should be lesser than 20 and three microns lesser than this would be borderline and one thing important here is we are speaking only of central area so maybe around five millimeter five and a half in the periphery you will always have values much higher than this if you are looking at a, a saddle pattern in a toric cornea uh, so when you when you look at your curvature maps it's not only important to look at your k reading but studying the pattern is extremely important so i would just uh, divide the patterns this is what all of us know and see so there are four things to look at when you're looking at your sagittal map and that is the symmetry asymmetric patterns skewed and special patterns so depending on the pattern you need to look at few things now the round overland symmetric bow tie are the symmetric patterns so here you look at the uh, if it's symmetric you, you know you're safer and if your k max is less than 47.2 it's okay anything more than that is suspicious and more than 50 is, uh, certainly is abnormal grossly and these four are the asymmetric patterns so when you have a superior inferior asymmetry uh, two things you need to look at is the superior steepening should not be more than 2.5 and if it's an inferiorly steep cornea, it ideally should not be more than 1.5 diopters. Now, the next set of patterns is the skewing, where there's a degree between your prime meridian and uh, something more than 2022 should arise a suspicion that it's an abnormal surface. And then there are a lot of patterns which have been described, but these are generally after the uh, irregularity is pretty uh, significant and there's a keratoconus very unlikely to have this in uh, early FFKC but these are the patterns again you have to be aware of. One important pattern is a vertex pattern which again could be an early sign uh, which you'll have to look at. So that's the same and this is how the same patterns look on the pentacam. Now the next thing you look for after the curvatures and uh, elevation is your pachymetry. So as refractive surgeons we know we are always looking at the thinnest pachy because most of us do have a cutoff of 470 to 480 when you are doing surface ablation. But more so than that it is important to look at the distribution of the pachymetry. 
so whenever you look at the pachy mat it's important to look at the 4 mm zone and look at the superior and inferior pachy matrices and this should not be less than 30 microns at the 4 mm zone so that is important and also do note another value of the thinnest pachy that should not be less than 10 microns uh, to the uh, central pachy and all the comparison with the other eye is extremely important the thinnest packet between both your eyes should be uh, not more than 30 microns so you also do have this keratoconic indices which the pentacam provides so basically case indices are from the era of the placido they basically derived from your surface scoring or surface irregularity there is no consideration of your posterior surface or pachymetry so i do take it with a limitation but yes looking at all of these being wide reassures that it's all fine you really don't have to buy hard because the pentacam gives an yellow scoring for borderline and a red scoring for your abnormal keratoconic indices and uh, next uh, very important talk of last few years has been the bat so we all know how the bellin ambrosio scoring is done so what we look at is the final d and uh, that's basically an amalgamation of all these five d's so again here you really don't have to buy hard there is color coding which is very accurate so anything more than 1.6 standard deviation the machine is going to give a yellow background and then you have a red so again it's i think each of us have our discretion how to go about red certainly is a no for refractive surgery yellow again i think we'll have to look into what are the parameters which is causing it yellow and either you plan for a surface ablation uh, uh, things like that again beyond the scope of today now these are the two uh, indices which has been a talk on lot of uh, uh, research publications that is ppi and art and they have been quite sensitive in picking up early ffkcs so i just want to elaborate this one concept of uh, progressive maps in the pentacam so if you look at the left side is a normal cornea right is a keratoconic cornea so all these pachymetry indices depends on how quick or how slow the central thinnest point becomes uh, towards the peripheral thickest point so as you see in the left side the uh, change in the thickness will be lesser and the right side because your periphery is thick the change from thinnest to thickest will be uh, quicker so i think it's a very interesting concept and uh, this is the same at 2 mm 4 mm 6 8 mm you see how the uh, rapid change of pachymetry happens so based on this you have the pti cstp and also the progressive index calculation so it's very important to ensure your progressive index is less than 1.2 Again, ART max has been spoken in lot of uh, research as to be a parameter which can pick up very early uh, disease. And anything uh, ART max uh, cutoff would be 339, 339, and an ART average of 427. You should uh, consider it as abnormal. So uh, now the indices, what I said is basically looking at the pattern, looking at the numbers. I think even a good optometrist can do it if you give him a printout. But I think what is more important is uh, how do you use these values in uh, real life? It's not so simple. You look at values and you say your cornea is normal or abnormal. So probably the next four to five cases I'll be showing. Uh, there are scenarios which really made us think beyond looking at just the indices and the numbers. And again, an example to talk we'll have to holistically look at and not only the indices so this is case one a 30 year old lady who had stopped contact lenses 10 years uh, prior to the pre-workup and this was a refractive error all the maps look okay other than this highly irregular tangential curvature superior steepening is there so uh, just by stopping the contact lens we see how smooth uh, contact lens for the further two uh, weeks shows us how much smoothing is achieved and after another two weeks she was much better so it's very important when we are doing pre uh, refractive screenings as many of our patients would be on contact lens so our standard advice of one week or two week may not be apt for all because there are a few corneas which may take a little more longer so i don't uh, we should not rush and look at one abnormal parameter and indices out of range and deny the advantage of lasik so any contact lens users if you feel there's only a surface uh, steepening always do stop your contact lenses so when i speak of warpage this this is just uh, to show how uh, severe the warpage could be so this was a 60 year old gentleman who came for 
uh, cataract assessment and we did uh, pentacam as he was opting for multifocal. So you see the posterior and pachy are fine but there is a certain flatness, uh, extreme flatness in the center. He had not undergone LASIK. So after three days you see the cornea has gone back to normal. So what exactly happened here was it was a flaw in our protocol. So the technician had done a contact A scan and then after half an hour or something had done a pentacam. So you see a huge flattening of six diapters just by doing a contact A scan. So it's not only the contact but also probably the epithelium might have been a little irregular which causes a lot of disparity in optical devices like pentacam. So again a holistic approach is extremely important. So always remember cornea has memory and always scan an untouched cornea. So the second case I put across again uh, looks certainly abnormal. You have steepness, you have a thin cornea at this point. So is it uh, in the back everything is wet? So this was actually a macular nebula grade scarring at that area. So again shows uh, that clinical correlation is extremely important and uh, many times there can be a small adenoviral scar that you are uh, looking as an abnormal topography and you would not want to deny a patient of, of a LASIK because of that. So always uh, correlate clinically. So the next case, uh, this was One a patient. minute remaining. Okay, I'm done. So this was a patient who came. Uh, he had brought a placido based scan and he was diagnosed to have keratoconus elsewhere and denied of LASIK. So this was his refractive, I think I am looking at the right eye. He had a 5 diopter with 0.5 diopters but somehow is not convinced because he didn't have a, a split or anything, no scissoring and that is a key parameter we considered. And also on the topography the sills were 2.8 whereas his acceptance was 0.5. So when we did a tomography, a pentacam, certainly an abnormal looking cornea. But what was different was the steepening was more inferior but the thinning was no, more superior. So again is it a scar, uh, there was no, it was a very clear cornea and could it be a movement of the eye? Again uh, Pentacam says no because the QS is quite sensitive to uh, fixation errors so if the patient had moved it would have not said okay. But then again still not convinced and we went deeper looking. So this is a photo of the keratograph where you can actually see where the placido images happen and certainly the patient is not looking at the light, he is looking somewhere up. And the reason for this clarity uh, uh, is because the fixation is not good. So either the pentacam Q has not picked, that is because this is not a fixation of the patient error. Patient has been fixating well but he has a paraphobial fixation. So because of that the eye is uh, rotated eccentrically and also in the pentacam you can see the fixation when you go to the overview map and whenever you have doubts you can always see if your patient's fixation is good. So obviously when your fixation errors are reduced and your topographies look much more smooth. So it's very important you have your entire team understand your refractive because th these are how our devices look and it's very confusing to the patient especially in pre lasic when you're doing back on back scans and such errors can happen. So it's important you show them what you're doing, educate them well and then go ahead with the scan. So I'll end my uh, 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 presentation with this last presentation. So this was a doctor's son who was interested in LASIK maybe a few years back. So when you look at the bad, certainly I would not touch this eye if I consider only bad. But when I look at the quad map, it's a perfectly healthy eye and 568, a very uh, keen interested boy for LASIK. So we just little uh, digged into his eye a little more to see why is this abnormality or disparity between bad and this. So then we noted the AC depth was very shallow and that made me think I should go and have a look at the white to white. So the white to white was very small, it was a small cornea. So it was around 10 clinically and 9.78 clinical, uh, 9.7 on the pentacam. So when you look back at how the bad scoring happens or the how does the machine say abnormal normal, you'll say it is based on a normative data. So obviously a small cornea, everything is much more crowded and does not fit into your normative data. And then I got into so many papers which did say that your bad is not accurate when you have an abnormal sized uh, cornea. So that gave us much more confidence. We went ahead with LASIK and he's doing perfectly fine I think 3-4 years back. So it's very important whatever technology you use, you know in depth about how your normative calculations happen, what is good and what is wrong according to the machine and take your decision. So I think I'll uh, 
skip this one last case and I think my take home message would be yes the indices are extremely important anything abnormal we'll have to see but I think it's equally important whatever machine we use understand it in depth don't go by a single printout there's so much more every machine can offer keep your mind open there's always this out of the box and always clinically correlate and in refractive surgery the mantra is always if you have any doubt one parameter I would say wait hold on reassess after a few months and then take a decision thank you so much very nice uh, example, Sipti, you actually brought it all. So then in, uh, in link with what you discussed in your third case, so if there is a little inferior superior asymmetry, um, how would you uh, differentiate it from a, a decentered apex syndrome? Yeah, I think that has been the talk of a lot of us surgeons of uh, maybe I would certainly take it with a pinch of salt ma'am I would not directly go I would surely prefer a uh, surface ablation but I think if your elevations are perfectly normal front back and all your other parameters normal descent and ablation is something which is sort of uh, getting upset accepted today and we ourselves have done quite a few of them and all of them are surface ablations and you, it's all dependent how big is your power how much ablation you're doing I think holistically if you feel everything is perfect I think we can go ahead just by ignoring that one single value of 1.5 so i don't think any uh, thing will have a magic number i think it's a holistic approach but we have been doing uh, medium to small power surface ablation when only this one parameter has been abnormal with fortunately very uh, stable corneas we've been, all of us been uh, doing good number of uh, refractive procedures would you feel that uh, uh, we uh, conclude this uh, talk with saying that uh, there should, what could be the pachymetry values if your uh, PTI is within normal uh, levels, what should be the pachymetry values for flap based procedures or smile procedures? Rajesh? I wish I had the answer to this question. <laughs> so for me, I, I, I don't have a perfect magic number, but I do look at the map qualitatively and quantitatively. And after assessing all the different parameters, I take into consideration. So I have treated surface ablation patients who are even 440, 450 with low myopic error. I've done a surface ablation. And at the same time, I have had patients who have sufficient corneal thickness, but because the map looks abnormal, I may have deferred the treatment. So I think it all depends on how you define what is normal and what is abnormal. So people should avoid the quantitative indices are basically as a guideline to raise red flags, but I don't think that these values are absolute numbers that you can go by and say that, you know, you are perfectly safe. But yes, anything less than 470 should definitely raise a red flag for surface ablation. If you want to do a LASIK, you have to take into consideration the amount of myopia or the refractive error that you're going to treat. So there you look at what kind of residual stromal bed or PTA value, you know, how, how much change you're doing, and then you take a call, you know, whether it's safe or whether would, you would like to choose another modality like a fatic eye. You would keep your cutoff as 470. I would have preferred to keep it 490 and below. I would uh, look at surface only. Yeah. In the sense, what I meant was that for 470 also, if somebody wants to do a surface ablation, Less than 470, you really need to go and look at the map and then proceed with surface. But between 470 and 500, you are still safe because in the normal distribution of corneal thickness, the lower end, you will get normal patients with that kind of corneal thickness values. You have any other question to ask in this very important uh, topic or do you move on? Can I, can I just... Uh, yes, yes. No. I, I think I would also look at uh, the... TBI and the uh, CBI, uh, especially uh, in those cases which are suspects. Uh, and in case uh, these are doubtful, uh, then I think I would uh, defer refractive surgery. Yes. Yes. Oh, that's I also had a point. If, you, if you have access to that, not only that, the other thing that in present time, I think looking at the epithelial maps is also nice because sometimes when you have an abnormal curvature, uh, you can always look at the epithelium thickness map and then decide, you know, whether that is creating that abnormality. 
No, we would be talking about that because we have epithelial map coming up separately. Is related sure. to indices. Anything further you would I like to add, Namrata, uh, Dr. Merl, Dr. Radhika? Just one point. Um, yeah. Basically, when we think about smile, so you know the, the the amount of ablation. I mean, not ablation. The amount of tissue that it takes off per day out is actually higher than uh, than LASIK, and that's something that we have to keep in mind. Even if a cornea is thin. Uh, you have to consider that uh, the amount that it's going to take away is more. So it works out to almost 20 microns per diopter. So the residual stromal bed is what we need to calculate, bearing this in mind. And uh, we've looked at the data and found that it's ranging from 18 to 20 diopters, uh, 18 to 20 microns per diopter. So we have to keep that in mind. I have one point to add. Uh, that is a lot of our, uh, in our country, a lot of patients coming are very young. They're often, you know, just 20, 21. And if you have any abnormal parameters like this, um, uh, it's also not a bad idea to watch them for some time because it may be something which is evolving. So you explain to them that it is borderline and then you watch them. Uh, and uh, so that's another thing I will just add. If, if, if in doubt, it's always like to, better to explain. Otherwise, the patient doesn't understand and they keep shopping and going here and there. So it's better to explain that this is the situation and let's watch and see if it's stable. Yes. So I think uh, uh, we shall now go on to our third speaker, Dr. Charuta, who is a senior consultant ophthalmologist and specialist in cataract, refractive and cornea services. Uh, she's also the founder of Oculus Regeneris Eye Care and Research Center. So on to you for a very interesting topic, ASOST, a guide for pre-op decision making in corneal surgeons. Uh, good evening to everyone. And at the outset, I'd like to thank Dr. Chitra, ma'am, for this uh, fantastic topic, all the organizers and AIOS for giving me an opportunity to speak on this dais. So I have no financial interests. Uh, uh, the, in the session, I'll be speaking on anterior segment OCT as a standalone modality for decision making, as an adjunct for the same. And uh, I'll be also speaking a little bit about comparison of uh, using the adapter attachment to a posterior segment OCT versus using a dedicated ASOCT device. And at the last uh, practical pulse for mastering the device that you have. Now, uh, the OCT, when it is used as a standalone modality, uh, it can be used from to, to all the layers. So when used to assess the tear film, it has been described to be recorded, uh, recording three parameters. That is the tear meniscus height, its depth and area. Now, particularly this is useful in quantification of a documented dramatic increase in the tear volume after applying maybe temporary uh, uh, plugs for dryness cases. So this has been described before. Now in the case of uh, uh, another interesting application is primary pterygia, wherein uh, elevation of the epithelium by a wedge-shaped mass, which is separating the epithelium from the underlying Bowman's layer is seen. Uh, the interpretation of the uh, anti-segment OCT showing residual can be used to predict the residual corneal opacity after surgery and also can predict uh, for difficult tissue dissections. Uh, another uh, important description is that the feature, uh, high resolution OCT features of flat bridging of the corneoscleral transition zone, uh, reduced thickness of the pterygium head and a greater degree of the corneal astigmatism which is associated with scarring. Uh, there is another study also which has shown that uh, increased uh, Zernike aberrations are found in the 5 millimeter zone of the cornea whenever the end of the pterygium exceeds 25% of the corneal diameter. Now, uh, a very pertinent uh, uh, situation for all corneal surgeons is uh, operating, for the, operating on a cataract in a post-keratoplasty patient. And the OCT image can show many details of this wound architecture. It can be helping in plan, it can be helpful in planning location of the incision, whether it is clear corneal, limbal, or corneal scleral. Also, the axis of incision can be based on the angle status. Uh, it can also show us uh, details of coaptation of the posterior wound. It will also tell us the residual pathology in the host, such as a PMCD, etc. Uh, these are three cases, clinical scenarios, wherein uh, in the first case, there is a fake here and the host rim is very hazy. So ASOCT shows disparity in the thickness of host uh, and the donor and can help in planning the incision and the direction of the keratome as well. Uh, second one, you can see here, it's a case of keratoconus wherein the anterior surface in the OCT is very smooth, but uh, there, is uh, there is a significant dis uh, distortion of the posterior uh, ledge. 
the last one we can see that <clears throat> there is 360 degree uh, peripheral anterior synechy in this case they have also said that uh, the uh, uh, radial scan or a uh, uh, global pachymetry and assessment of the raw maps uh, revealed that a, an uh, uh, incision at a 45 degree axis would be helpful now uh, one of the most commonly used uh, 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 application of the oct is for desmet membrane attach uh, uh, assessment and it can be useful in uh, diagnosing the problems choosing a treatment and also monitoring the outcomes uh, the image shows a residual desmet membrane in a case of a dmac where there is detachment now undoubtedly uh, it is uh, uh, also very, very valuable in uh, uh, assessment of the panis before planning for any surface surgery and um, uh, in case in uh, this is a study which has been done by dr shanba where the role of oct in decision making before slit has been described now this white bar below indicates a, a thickness of 250 microns and um, as observed here you can see the three images uh, the last one uh, the second case uh, b is the one in which uh, slit is alone is going to be enough for uh, resolving the visual uh, uh, for attending to the visual recovery of the patient in the first case as you can see the thickness th is too less and uh, the stromal support is probably going to be not enough for the stem cells to take up in the case number 3 and 4 uh, there is a tremendous amount of scarring below the panis also which is also going to predict uh, difficult dissections now another uh, interesting application of corneal dystrophy uh, of uh, oct is in the management of corneal dystrophies wherein much of the planning of the uh, treatment is also based on the oct scans now i'm sure that in most cases uh the presence of opacities in the dystrophy don't actually uh, make it difficult to distinguish between whether it's superficial or deep however uh, when we need to plan the mass how much of uh, epithelium needs how much of the uh, deposit needs to be ablated uh, so that the epithelial masking can help us achieve an even surface the oct is definitely uh, plays a major role now post endothelial keratoplasty again uh, it's invaluable to diagnose graft dislocation also to detect primary graft failure crowding of the anterior chamber in case of thick grafts encroachment of angles uh, in secondary glaucoma cases pupillary blocks also to detect inadequate strippings and the residual host dm so interestingly uh, there is also now these are the routine uh, applications which we have very commonly seen however they have now uh, there is also there are studies which have predicted that post endothelial keratoplasty it is imperative to do a uh, 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 oct assessment uh, in the immediate post op so uh, uh, between 1 hour and 1 day post operatively now it is invaluable uh, because uh, the transient interface fluid at the end of surgery and uh, in the first post operative day they have shown that it is very likely that such fluid can is more likely to develop textural interface opacity which we very commonly see and leads to loss of a best corrected visual acuity also large residual uh, interface volume uh, thickness and the thickness of the cornea at the end of the surgery are associated with graft detachment in cases of post uh, deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty the imaging demonstrates uh, the detachment of the dm if, if it occurs and also can demonstrate or confirm uh, the reattachment in all angles after intracameral air injection now pre and post uh, hydrops now what do i mean by pre and post hydrops very commonly thus far oct has been used to demonstrate the cleft in the hydrops cases and then selection of the cases as to which ones will benefit like as in the first two images we see this case has benefited from doing a rebubble bubbling with c3 or with c3f8 or a or air and in this case wherein a bubbling is probably not going to be useful and one can go in for a primary graft uh, directly uh, now what do i mean by pre hydrops prediction so uh, fuentes et al in 2015 described a series of cases wherein they had followed up serially all cases of keratoconus and they have demonstrated that there is increased risk of hydrops in cases with anterior segment oct findings of increased epithelial thickness stromal thinning at the area of the cone anterior hyperreflectivity or the baumann's layer and absence of stromal scarring so these are three of their cases which they have beautifully shown uh, all the features that is uh, you can see there's a 
the total thickness of the cornea is probably quite normal however the stroma is very thin and there is a lack of scarring in all the cases so these can be used practically in the outpatient uh, uh, clinic to use as predictors for high drops uh, another interesting application is that in keratoprosthesis where in the presence of uh, retrokeratoprosthetic membranes can be detected on the asocd a gap in the interface can also be seen uh, very easily visualized and located uh, lack of the epithelial sealing around capro edge can also be uh, detected and an anatomic other anatomic changes which cannot be detected because of a failed graft such as angle closure peripheral synechy iris and keratoprosthesis processes backplate touch and graft host interface interface changes can be noted now although uh, the, these uh, thus far i have described uh, the anterior segment oct as the primary diagnostic modality many a times it does play an adjunctive role and uh, by adjunctive role it actually uh, you, the you, it does it means it doesn't mean that it's playing a secondary but actually a very useful role uh, very uh, commonly we see detection of uh, form frustate keratoconus is being missed on the on, uh, on the topography maps and uh, the epithelial map and uh, learning how to read the epithelial mapping is very pertinent now so that we can appropriately select cases before doing laser vision correction another application is that that uh, before lasik enhancement because it is only possible to precisely measure our flaps uh, sometimes cases are operated outside or referred so the oct gives us that uh, advantage and the and for predicting the residual stromal bed thickness after an enhancement procedure other uh, application include diagnosis of the interface fluid uh, fluid syndrome and confirmation of resolution of the fluid in the same this is a case of uh, a keratoconus uh, case with apical scarring and significant posterior keratoconus in which the patient wanted to plan for a femtosecond dulk now in this case if we can see that the only the pachymetry map alone will help us in planning the femtosecond dulk procedure because only the peripheral 5 to 7 or 7 to 9 mm zones are showing enough thickness so that we can plan the ring ring cuts and the lamellar cuts appropriately another application interesting application is that in keratitis although uh, personally um, I, i have never used it for this indication but uh, it has been shown to uh, detect both fluid clefts to distinguish between necrosis and inflammation per se uh, and also to detect serially detect the resolution of edema in stromal keratitis cases now that brings me to the next part of my talk wherein uh, uh, what is the difference between a posterior segment oct using a posterior segment dedicated posterior segment oct with the adapter to a dedicated anterior segment oct is it worth it now posterior segment octs typically have shorter wavelength as compared to the dedicated as oct machine uh, and there's a little bit of more shadowing than the dedicated anterior one however it doesn't it means that there's going to be no additional investment uh and the image acquisition is much faster whereas in the uh, dedicated anterior segment oct although it gives an excellent view and uh, very clarity lot of clarity in the images uh it does mean an additional investment and the acquisition time is much slower so uh, uh at the end i'd like to say that uh, uh once you work with what you have you can realize that there are a lot of details that can be observed so try to uh, he don't hesitate to image normal corneas keep the uh, uh, axis perpendicular when you are measuring anything and make sure you use softwares and uh, measure perpendicularly and also expect that there is a learning curve in understanding each device and making the best of it wonderful talk it was actually you covered all parts of it and uh, many of the questions which had are planned for you have been answered <laughs> okay i escaped it that shows how well you covered it um, but uh, uh, dr rajesh i'm going to ask you in this question because all our uh, institution based uh, expert panel so i'm sure they have all the equipments but even you would i'm sure but do you think a private practitioner actually needs to get an as oct does it does it become a differentiator in decision taking in corneal surgeries yeah definitely i think uh, an anterior segment oct for analyzing the cornea 
plays an important role both in clinical decision making, uh, you know, and patient education as well, because you're able to show to the patient in cross section, you know, let's say a DM detachment, if you show the patient an ASOCT and, and show them the problem, uh, the, the subsequent management and the patient's acceptance of treatment becomes much more easier, or like, let's say high drops, uh, there is a break in the posterior area, or let's say you want to plan treatment post LASIK, you want to look at the flap thickness. So, you know, it, 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 it's very vital. And the modern anterior segment OCT is not just for cornea. You can use it for many things. It gives you mabography. It gives you, uh, you know, you can do epithelial maps with your anterior segment OCT. You can even look at the regional pachymetry on the anterior segment OCT, and it's quite comparable to the ultrasound pachymetry, which is better than some of the tomography devices, especially if patients have had like cross-linking or anything which induces a little bit of haze in the cornea, then the pachymetry measurement by the tomography devices are not very accurate. So in that scenario, uh, the anterior segment OCT is able to give you much better uh, corneal thickness assessment. And surgical planning, it plays a major role. And I'm sure Namrata uh, can share having the intra-op OCT uh, integrated into your yeah. microscope plays such a big role uh, in, 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 in a lot of surgical situations as well. Yeah, I think uh, it was very nicely covered. The whole talk covered uh, almost everything. Uh, in acute hydrops, it plays a very important role because you can drain intrastomally also the fluid. In posterior keratitis, it plays an important role because you can see the posterior corneal abscess and you can see whether it is active or not. I think the greatest role is in in our DMEC surgeries. I know Rajesh is a very uh, accomplished surgeon and can do without it. But I think Dr. Radhika will agree completely that we have become so dependent on it that, you know, we become helpless without it. And it plays a very important role as far as the general ophthalmologists are concerned for cases of persistent corneal edema after phaco emulsification. Because all you need to do is do one ASOCT and see whether there is any DMD or not, and you can immediately address it. So I think uh, on all these features, there are uh, publications which are there and uh, everything was covered. I mean, and, and I think the greatest use is in the retained lenticule when you're doing a spile surgery and you can't make out where it is. So everything was covered really very well. I think it was an excellent talk. Yes, truly. It was an excellent talk and I think it becomes very important for us to understand all the that needs to be seen uh, in each of these uh, imaging devices. Any Ma'am, can you make a quick comment? Yes. Yes, yes Dr. Yeah. So I think uh, the role of ASOCT is very well established in the diagnosis of corneal diseases and also in conjunctiva as she beautifully uh, demonstrated. But I think the problem is when you have fluid, or you have a solid structure or you have blood where it causes a lot of back shadowing and you really do not know what you're dealing with. The, the reason I'm saying this is actually recently we had a patient with dystrophy who also had a conjunctiva lesion in the bulbar conjunctiva which was gradually increasing in size, really didn't fit, did not fit into any particular uh, diagnosis, no trauma, no surgery. So we went ahead and excised it and OCT only saw superiorly a bit of stroma. The lesion was occupying almost causing considerable back shadowing of the anterior stroma. Then when we removed it, we saw one of the very rare tumors, which is the cos tumor. So the, the limitation is definitely when you have uh, something that is blocking the light, which is definitely difficult to resolve. So going back to the question that you asked about uh, the different um, imaging modalities or uh, different instruments, I think, uh, like you rightly said, only institutions will have access to all these things. But if you want greater tissue resolution, you probably want to use something that has better resolution. If you want to look at the lesion as a whole, then you want to use something that has a reasonable resolution where you're able to see the back posterior extent as well. And if you really want to look at holistically the relationship of the lesion to the anterior segment, then you have Swepsos OCTs which can actually give you all the details. So there are certain indications for using each of these appliances if they are available. Yeah, thanks a lot. I would be also truly obliged if we are not all of uh, with the video off because you know that it becomes even uh, webinars are impersonal it really gets too impersonal so i think uh, my expert panel and four speakers should have the video on uh, that was a wonderful talk so we shall now go on to our fourth speaker dr uh, sunita chorasia who is a consultant cornea anterior segment refractive and also Pediatric corneal services from uh, uh, services from Elgi Prasad uh, uh, Hyderabad, 
and she is going to tell us uh, something more on a very important topic usefulness of specular microscopy in clinical practice on to you dr sunit yeah thank you madam i'll share my screen now yeah are my slides visible yes yes yeah so uh, this topic is something uh, which is again uh, very important clinically and uh, thank you madam for uh, giving this opportunity so i'll be talking of the relevance of endothelial imaging using specular microscopy specular microscopy we all know by basic principle it depends upon the optical principle of specular reflection which means an incident light and a reflected light passing through the area of interest which is the corneal endothelium and you are able to image by means of the specular reflection this is casted as an image and is interpreted by means of the image which is procured on specular reflection so one of the important things in interpretation is the quality of the image which is of paramount importance in its interpretation so we have to really see that the image what is procured is analyzable and thereafter we should do a clinical specular correlation there are certain abnormalities in the tear film which could be because of the abnormal tearing or uh, unhealthy tear film haze in the stroma desmets membrane irregularities which is namely cutte which is seen in fuchs endothelial dystrophy and pigments on the endothelium which can result in blurred images of the from the specular microscopy and hence these images may not be suitable for analysis in interpreting specular microscopy it is also important and very relevant to know the age related endothelial changes which happen in the in the endothelium in with respect to the endothelial cell density and the mean cell area we almost always talk about the ecd but the mean cell area is something which we should be always knowing decade wise change to interpret and make sense of the specular microscopy quantitative parameters uh, this is a specular microscopy of a normal 10 year old this is an example of a good analyzed image from the central corneal um, area we can see there's a mark over here in the arrow showing the rest of so this is in the central cornea and these quantitative parameters are reliable because the image is very good we can make out the dark and white borders clearly so this is a fair is a very good image which is giving a very fair analysis and this is bound to be reproducible with very minimal test retest variability on the account that the image is good and analyzable so few questions come with respect to specular microscopy what is its role in fuchs endothelial dystrophy and can it be used to decide when to perform triple procedure versus combined surgery in a patient with fecd so so specular microscopy in fuchs endothelial dystrophy is useful but it should be interpreted correctly in the light of the limitations of the this optical imaging system we know that fuchs endothelial dystrophy is characterized by gutte which interfere with the image capture of the endothelial cells because the extra senses are not able to provide an imaging of the endothelium and hence these areas are seen as drop out areas on specular microscopy further additionally what happens is that the type of gutte characterize the procured image in early age fuchs which is also called as the early onset fuchs the fu uh, the gutte tend to be fine confluent and numerous and because of this nature the image is often non analyzable without a clinical edema in the patient's eye so inability to image the endothelial cells in these cases that not necessarily mean the absence of endothelial cells or its function so true nature and functionality of endothelium in cases with fecd is primarily known by the symptoms and clinical signs as we see on the sit lab if the specular images are reliable then vital information can be derived from the specular images itself and there can be certain indirect clues which are obtained from the image cells from the mid peripheral region we know that fuchs is a central corneal disorder to begin with and thereafter spreads to the periphery so the images from the mid peripheral area also gives us an opportunity to know about the status of the eye condition this is just to show five images of one of uh, five different patients so we see the first image which is non analyzable this is an early age fuchs endothelial dystrophy where the visual acuity is 20 20 patient did not have any complaints he only had numerous gutte and because of this reason the image is non analyzable because we are not able to procure the image the pacchi was 468 and 470 in this patient and this patient had nil symptoms the second image is from a patient again from the central cornea and we can see that the ecd is 2600 the image is fairly reliable because you have intervening cells which are of normal uh, cell area the mean cell area is 398 which is as per the age it was normal and third image is again of a patient who has more numerous gutte but if you look at the acd ecd is uh, 2400 
mean cell rate is 423 which is as per the normal of the age of the patient the fourth image of another patient where the ecg is 1400 and this is from the peripheral area the last which is 4 and 5 are from the peripheral region and here we can see that the mean cell area is 627 which is far more than twice and what is uh, normal for that age and the last one is certainly completely abnormal because we can see that the mean cell area is completely uh, out of range which is not which is almost like four times what normal should have been all five images are in the same magnification so uh, based upon these pictures now we see the first image the patient did not have any clinical edema in the second and third obviously if a patient has cataract that can patient can simply go for cataract surgery alone in the fourth it will be risky to just do cataract surgery alone this patient will require a transplant and in the fourth obviously there's no question that the patient definitely needs a combined surgery this is how we are going to interpret specular microscopy in fuchs and ureteral dystrophy based upon the intervening cells now we have another modality in fuchs we often think about doing a dso not a very standard of care but then which cases can go for dso versus dmec this is one such case which has a patch of endothelial layer and patch of abnormal area and we can see cornea as such seems to be compact in the periphery from the central area we are not able to capture the images because obviously there's a sheet of abnormal desmids membrane and from the peripheral area this patient this third image the c image is in down gaze and we can see a good endothelial cell density 2301 this patient if one wants to attempt dso can possibly consider in this patient what about this patient this is another patient who had an image looking like this one we see new far numerous goti and this is again from the periphery though the cut off for doing dso is 1000 cells in the periphery this cells don't look healthy and the cell density is 1476 but when we look at intraoperatively as this is just a staining prior to doing the cataract surgery and dmec so that we can see the abnormal staining pattern on the endothelium showing that the there's a loss of the endothelial cells over here and that is why you have the staining pattern so this image which has been captured from the peripheral area preoperatively shows this kind of flare but which is certainly not suitable for going for a okay, sir, yes, this patient was planned for a dmec surgery another uh, reason why a specular microscopy should be done is to uh, formulate an accurate diagnosis of a clinical condition many endothelial disorders can be confused with fuchs endothelial dystrophy such as non fuchs pseudophagic corneal edema pseudo exfoliation angle closure glaucoma chronic uveitis specular imaging helps in making in a proper appropriate diagnosis this is to share one case who had a history of decreased vision since 2 months in the right eye both eyes have had pc uh, have had cataract surgery od had corneal edema the pack in the right eye 619 and 554 in the left eye and this was diagnosed as case of fuchs endothelial dystrophy od obviously the corneal images the endothelial images was not procured because of corneal edema but if you look at the left eye specular images this is certainly not a case of fuchs endothelial dystrophy it is a non fuchs pseudophagic corneal edema probably is the iatrogenic factors accounting for the cell decline in the other eye so imaging from the opposite eye helps in formulating the diagnosis for this particular eye this is another patient who had a right eye poor vision and od vision was 2320 left eye was 2020 he is a patient of uh, pacg on anti glaucoma medication cornea on clinical examination showed diffuse endothelial pigments of variable size and there was peripheral focal corneal edema again labeled as fuchs but then if you look at this is the dropout areas but then if you look at the clinical specular correlation it is not fuchs because these these are mainly because of these are cast as shadows as dropout areas because of the pigments on the endothelium so many other entities have a very uh, peculiar endothelial characteristic one such dystrophy is a posterior polymorphous dystrophy one needs to be aware of in this endothelial imaging in general reveals a low endothelial cell density cornea may be compact but there's a increased cell area and low endothelial cell density in these eyes this is just to show one patient who's a 25 year old and the both eyes are involved one eye has a serpentine band like pattern and drop and dotted uh, dots and vesicles and the left eye shows more prominent findings of bands and vesicles so this is the specular image captured from different parts of the eye showing low endothelial cell density and these are certainly not normal for a patient who is 25 year old to have this amount of cell density and this cell area but this this is what is the peculiarity of this posterior polymorphous corneal endothelial dystrophy another patient of this dist of uh, the same dystrophy this was a 35 year old with a unilateral involvement the left eye is normal but if you look at the right eye right eye had serpentine band like patterns like this and this patient also had a steep cornea now this is an important you finding you have one minute remaining ma'am this uh, condition because 
many of these patients get labeled as keratoconus. So when we do the specular, we can see that there's a low cell density and the opposite is normal. Another entity is to map out the area of abnormality in IC syndrome and this is very typically characterized by dark light reversal pattern of the corneal endothelial imaging. And this helps in knowing the abnormality even though the cornea may look compact and vision may be good, but helps in mapping out the abnormal areas on the endothelium. Another uh, indication, many of the patients with grau uh, the grafts have, uh, can develop cataract and we may have to plan cataract surgery in these eyes to know how suitable the, the eye is to undergo and tolerate the cataract surgery, one would want to do a specular microscopy in these eyes. Monitoring the health of the graft status, both PK and EK, is important to do a serial specular microscopy. Now, this is one patient who had a DSEC done 10 years ago, and this is the morphology of the eye. And this is another patient, another patient who had DSEC surgery 10 years ago. Now, we can see the, how bad the endothelium is in the, in, the other, in the second patient versus the first eye. This patient did well and at 11th year we can see the graft is clear but this patient expected to have a late donor failure and this is how he landed at the 11th year. So the serial monitoring of the endothelial in grafted eyes is really important. One more indication nowadays many patients because uh, they are put on ripacidil for IOP control it is important to do serial specular imaging to distinguish a graft failure or a uh, graft rejection versus uh, donor failure in patients who are using ripacidil. So th this typically happens, the ripacidil related uh, epithelial edema in patients who have got a poor endothelium. So unless we know the, uh, what the pre-operative endothelial count, uh, at least the previous visit endothelial count was, we will probably treat these patients as rejection. But to know a kind of patient who has low endothelial cell density, we know what, uh, what edema could be because of, it's not possibly because of rejection, but mainly because of low endothelial cell density. And ripacidil helps uh, kind of manifest the epithelial edema in such eyes. The relevance of specular microscopy in eye banks is often is very important. We know that it is a very important tool in the eye bank to assess the donor cornea allocation for various surgeries. And these are the ECD guidelines which we follow for donor cornea selection. Thank you for your patient listening. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Yes, that was a, a wonderful talk, Dr. Sunita. Uh, question to you or Dr. Merle is something uh, very simple for a, a, a comprehensive ophthalmologist. Like, when would you do specular microscopy in a lamellar uh, corneal surgery? And if there is an interface haze, which could also impact the quality of assessment. So, would you uh, tell us that whether you should do a central approach or a paracentral approach, or how would you, which location would you look for? So, uh, uh, is Dr. Merle uh, there? Yes. So, uh, primarily, we'd want to know the central corneal endothelial density in, uh, in, in most indications, but in, in FECD, it becomes more relevant because of the nature of the condition is such that it affects the central cornea first and then the peripheral cornea. So, we get some, gather some information by imaging the peripheral cornea. But in general, for the lamellar surgeries, we would want to know what is the central endothelial cell density because that gives the best idea and free from aberrations also because when you image the peripheral cornea you also get some curvature related issues and that could also impact your cell density so for consistency of follow-up of the patients it is important to view these specular images right from the central part of the cornea thank you uh, dr rajesh i think it's a very well covered uh, yeah. presentation uh, the only thing about the comprehensive ophthalmologist is that whenever you are planning a complex cataract surgery, it's always advisable to get a pre-op specular done and have an idea of what the cell count is like. So, you know, you if you have post-operative corneal edema, you will be able to then determine, you know, whether it was because of uh, low endothelial cell count uh, uh, or it is something related to the surgery, uh, which can recover in four to eight weeks. Oh, I just realized our next speaker has not joined in, Dr. Rashmi Deshmukh. I think, uh, Chitra, this was yeah. one of the most interesting talks on a subject like specular microscopy, yes. which can yes. be really boring, True. Uh, to, you know, but it was made so well oh, by uh, because yeah. uh, with all the examples and all the case presentation yeah. yes. that it has taken a different, uh, you know, dimension. Yes. So, talk, Sunita. Yeah, in fact, it has been, uh, it's been in, an invaluable talk. I was amazed how a, a, such a dreary topic as that could have been made so good. Uh, it's, uh, I, I don't know, I've never got any uh, message from Rashmi. Probably she's not been well, but 
having said that, uh, although there are not going to, this talk is not there since Rashmi has not yet joined it, uh, we could take the questions like uh, her topic was role of epithelial <clears throat> mapping and biomechanics in refractive surgery. Are they a must for refractive surgeons? So I think uh, we'll cover up for the loss of this talk by um, both uh, all of us discussing some of the relevant questions like then maybe I'll start off with one very essential question we need to keep in mind when you're talking of refractive surgery and epithelial mapping. So in a case of a post-myopic ablation where we are planning to do enhancement uh, and you see epithelial hyperplasia uh, as on ASOCT. So what would you do? Would you want to follow up this patient on serial maps to check on the stability and then wait and plan your enhancement or would you take it up? And uh, how would we exactly treat this? Like, how would the presence of epithelial hyperplasia make us plan our enhancement procedures? Um, whom do we ask? Should I ask Dr. Merle? Uh, so I think that's very relevant because um, the reason that you have a regression is because of a high ablation and the epithelial hypertrophy is to be expected. So obviously, if you're planning to treat that, then the hypertrophy may recur. So I'm not sure whether you should treat such kind of cases or not. Okay. So you would use it, you would uh, kind of do the uh, mapping, you know, kind of to understand whether it's increasing over time. But uh, I have not actually looked at or, or tried to kind of ablate, uh, ablate re-ablate those cases where you've already had a, a you know, a, a regression because of the epithelial hyperplasia. Rajesh, uh, what's your experience? No, how See, I'll, I'll, I'll share a very interesting case. Uh, I had a, a patient, a young myope with only about minus 0.75 uh, diopters of myopia with 0.5 cylinder. And he and because of the low myopia, I offered him to do a surface ablation. And I did the trans PRK. So I used Streamlight and I plugged in 50 microns for the epithelium and I did the ablation. And it just happens that after the treatment, he came back, he still had minus 0.75 refractive error remaining. So, you know, so what I did not do in this patient was I had not done an epithelial mapping. So I don't know what the pre-op epithelial thickness was. And I assume that 50 microns is standard. So if looking at the fellow eye, you know, if you look at it, his central thickness was close to 60 microns. So that can explain, you know, a, a, a diopter of ablation uh, using the XIMO laser, it ablates about 13, 14 microns of stroma. So if you have thick epithelium and you do a trans PRK, sometimes you may end up under correcting. Same thing happens with if you have a patient who has come back with regression of let's say minus one diopter or minus 1.5. If you don't do an epithelial map and don't look at that, you know, whether he has epithelial hyperplasia, you, you know, if you're doing a, a treatment, you may miss out uh, doing the right calculation. And sometimes you can wait over a period of time. The epithelial hyperplasia can regress, you know, so uh, you can do serial uh, epithelial mapping over two to three months and then see whether that makes any kind of difference. Maybe how I would summarize is like, if there is excessive epithelial hyperplasia, I would even consider doing just a PTK and see how, whether the residual error does stay or not. If there is uh, epithelial hyperplasia and there is significant residual error and the epithelial hyperplasia is stable, then I would not do a PRK as a mode of enhancement. I would lift the flap. But if there is no, it's a normal epithelium, then uh, based on the duration of treatment, like if it is within three years, then I could consider lifting a flap. And if it is much, much more, then I would do a PRK for enhancement, maybe would that be the summary of it? Yeah. So, so, so this patient, when he came back and then we tried to explain to him, the next treatment I did was I mechanically removed the epithelium and I did the PRK. I repeated it and then he did perfectly fine. So the, the question is, at that point of time, I did not have access to epithelial mapping. I got it done elsewhere. But now when we have it, I think this is something that we can do uh, epithelial mapping and uh, plan our treatment, especially if you're treating very low myopic errors, because that epithelial thickness variations can affect your outcome if you're doing a trans -PRK. Yeah. 
And it is very also, useful, very useful for screening the abnormal maps in contact lens wearers as well, where you look at the topography and it looks abnormal. So epithelial mapping is a very useful adjunct uh, to you know analyze the map and then. Yeah. Yes. So more so, I think also in cases of uh, mild cases of keratoconstrictive topo guided uh, collagen crosslinking. And there again, the epithelium is going to be, you know, uh, is going to be uh, different or can is going to be asymmetrically thick at certain areas and not so thick at the other areas. So I think there it still remains an enigma and we really don't know, uh, you know, how it behaves. Yeah. Uh, we cannot predict its behavior in those cases. Uh, I prefer to give steroids for six weeks post, uh, you know, epithelial hyperplasia plus post uh, PRK, trans PRK, and then uh, consider uh, retreatment or extra treatment enhancement, because I've seen that epithelium regresses with six weeks of tapering steroids. That's my experience. I, I put in temporary plugs and I find that if you improve the tear film, that somehow uh, helps him stabilize the epithelium as well. So it, it kind of improves the surface, the tear film becoming stable. The, uh, the epithelium tends to regularize better. But yes, you can still continue with your low dose topical steroids, which may also uh, impact by reducing the surface inflammation as well. Ma'am, are you on mute? Yeah, would you would you look at all do all this prior before we take a call whether you're going to do enhancement for this patient more in the league with what you're saying like would you use a tear plug to see whether the epithelium continues to remain stable and then only yeah, do i i am not a big fan of uh, doing enhancement the, the first time i see a patient so at least i i need stable topography three months apart if, yes. if he has, uh, you know, uh, uh, if the surface looks dry, he has dry symptoms, I'll manage that. I will do an epithelial map. And only once I'm sure I've understood why there is a refractive error, I will be able to successfully correct that. If, right in the first visit, if you try to jump in and plan a treatment, more than often you will have unpredictable outcomes. Yes. Anything else, Dr. Radhika, you want to add something? You have to unmute yourself. Well, I agree that whenever you have a person coming back with a regression, epithelial hypertrophy, it's extremely important to observe and do uh, everything um, that you can to improve lubrication, control inflammation, look at other factors. And only when it is stable, then you plan further. Yeah. And, yeah from uh, the patient perspective is something different. Patient wants an instant treatment. You know, they will come, they will try to push you that, you know, I, I, I have power, I, you need to do something. But if you explain to them, you do this test and, uh, you know, make them understand that this is for their own benefit. I think most of them do understand. And yes, it's also extremely important to uh, uh, warn, um, you know, warn or sort of make them mentally aware of all these possibilities before okay. surgery. So cool. you have to say that there are certain mathematical calculations and then there is biology and the human body is not a machine. So be prepared for such, uh, you know, variations, uh, so that they they're sort of mentally prepared before. Yeah. Now, how would you, uh, since biomechanics is also a part of this talk, how would you look at the reliability of Corbis machine in distinguishing a subclinical uh, KC from a normal light? Now, would you actually look on it now, where it stands as a standalone machine, or it's a corroboration of all uh, factors which make still keep Scorvis behind. Uh, Dr. Merle, you have to unmute yourself. Sorry. Yes, yeah, so I think it's not just Scorvis standalone. I think it's basically you look at all the other parameters and then you tie that in with Corvus and then take a call. Um, I don't think it would be on its own a device which can tell you yes, suitable for surgery or suspect or whatever it is. Uh, yes, sure. Uh, Dr. Think, Rama? Uh, yeah, I agree with Dr. Mal. I think uh, we do the screening. Uh, as part of screening, we do the tomography and we also do the uh, Corvus uh, for, as a part of screening for refractive surgery patients. But 
Uh, yes, if all your other parameters are normal and only the corbus is abnormal, especially if your TPA is abnormal, then you certainly want to go back and look at all the other parameters. Are we dealing with the corneal thickness that is borderline? Are we dealing with the steep cornea or are there any risk factors in the form of keratoconus in the family? And then you look at the refractive maps and the battery screening. So as put, putting everything together comprehensively, Corvus adds value to it, but I certainly know, I'm not very sure whether you can call it as a standalone uh, test to decide whether or not a patient can have refractive procedure. Yes. Uh, Dr. Rajesh? Well, I don't have access to a Corvus machine, yeah. but yes, I, I agree that, you know, the parameters, both the TBI, CBI, uh, can help, uh, uh, you know, further enhance our understanding whether, you know, whether a particular patient is suitable for refractive surgery or not, if the topography or tomography is abnormal. Yeah. Uh, so if there are no other questions, uh, shall we go on to our next speaker? Uh, because this was an important topic. Uh, so I, I just want to say one thing, Chitra, that I think TBI and CBI is something that we should see yes. in all cases. And it does help if it is abnormal, yes. then uh, you would uh, defer the surgery ask the patient to come again because sometimes these parameters even if they're abnormal you need to actually repeat them i mean you need to actually see you know whether it is going in the right, right direction or not and if it is abnormal then we wouldn't do refractive surgery for such cases yeah. and if it is suspect then i would uh, think of doing a prk extra i know when i talk of prk extra it blows up a whole lot of uh, controversies where there are many of you here who are again not for cross-linking along with the laser vision correction but I would look at doing a PRK extra for these patients instead of just doing a PRK if everything apparently looks normal, but just these uh, COVID indices are in the red. Uh, or, or a fake IUL if the uh, it de uh, demands. Dr. Namrata, would you want to say anything on that? No, again, I'm not a very big fan of extra procedure, Chitra. So, uh, uh, we hardly do any extra procedures. Uh, we, uh, uh, I'm sure we need a huge sample size actually to say, you know, uh, in thousands probably to say that for the same amount of uh, refractive error and for the same amount of corneal thickness, you do uh, extra in half of the cases and you don't do extra and then see, you know, uh, again, because the chances of ectasia are so less you need a huge sample size to know whether it makes any difference or not. But yes, I think for your own uh, mental piece of, uh, you know, for your own mental piece, you probably can do extra, but I don't think, I mean, I don't know whether it really helps or not. Yeah. Uh, then we shall go on to our next speaker, Dr. Uma Sridhar, who's a senior consultant, cataract cornea services from Eye Care Eye Hospital and Postgraduate Institute, Noida. And she's going to talk on some another very relevant topic uh, for phototherapeutic keratectomy indications and planning surgical techniques. On to you, Dr. Uma. Thank you, Dr. Chitra. Am I, uh, my screen is seen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me. Such a galaxy of uh, experts here. And I have learned a lot from everybody, it's, uh, especially from Dr. Foglav, Dr. Namrata, Dr. Tandon. Uh, so... Uh, the one or, uh, or two articles like Dr. Christopher Rapuano's and from Praveen's article in and Rashmi's article in IJO, I learned a lot about uh, this procedure. I have been doing this for corneal dystrophy <coughs> mainly and uh, for some corneal scars and pre cataract surgery. So uh, even before this article came out, we had formulated our own algorithm for treating corneal opacities, especially anterior corneal opacities. And uh, we uh, were very happy to see that the article agreed with our uh, parameters. That is, we divide them uh, according to pachymetry, which could be in ASOCT or in ultrasonic pachymetry as less than 100 microns. Then we prefer to do a PTK with or without a PRK. And if the opacity is more than 100 microns depth, then uh, and less than 250 microns depth, we do a falc. Uh, we haven't done salc yet, but we prefer to do a falc. And if it is more than 250 microns, we do a DAL kit. So eczema lasers are very uh, accurate to treat the anterior corneal disorders. They do not damage the adjacent tissue. We, I mean, they can be used to treat spheroidal degeneration, non-calcific band-shaped keratopathy, corneal scars, recurrent corneal erosions, anterior variant of granular dystrophies, 
maybe the superficial part of lattice dystrophy reese buckler and thiel bentes bowman membrane dystrophies they have been approved by the fda for treatment of corneal pathologies in the anterior one third that is 15 to 20% of the cornea as an alternative to lamellar keratoplasty we have seen that even in falc there is a lot of interface issues there and uh, precision of the eczema laser ablating accurately with no damage to the surrounding tissue and each pulse ablates 0.25 microns of the tissue so pre operative planning is extremely important and we know that we can ablate 10 to 20% of the stroma without a fear of ectasia patient symptoms are very important one has to know is the decreased vision and the irritation etc due to the raised lesions and there is no other pathology which is causing the decreased vision and the symptoms and the cause of the decreased vision is the corneal opacity and nothing at the posterior segment or any other uh, issue that is there there are a lot of red flags a history of previous hsv keratitis is extremely important it can get reactivated after the eczema laser procedure if there are decreased corneal sensations then the epithelial healing will be impaired in extremely thin corneas when there is lid malfunction which we ignored if there is any dry eye and tear film abnormality and ocular surface disorder where again the epithelial healing would be a problem in systemic disorders like diabetes collagen vascular disorder these are the red flags one should look at so in the pre operative evaluation a slit lamp is a simple technique to see the location size and depth whether uni or bilateral then also we have to evaluate the refractive status of the eye and is it in a young patient obviously uh, you have to look at the refractive status and in the older age whether we are planning a cataract surgery or not that will increase uh, that will uh, decide whether you are planning a refractive procedure along with it only a, or only a ptk and not a prk with it the efficacy of the procedure would also depend on the pre operative symptoms refractive status location depth of lesion and then we have to plan the procedure so what are the investigations that we would do we do do a pachymetry and uh, preferably leave a residual breadth thickness of 250 to 300 microns so some people say it can be even more and we would do an optical or uh, which we don't do nowadays but an asoct and ultrasonic pachymetry which uh, dr charuta has explained beautifully in the anterior segment oct topography can diagnose ectasias map irregular areas subtle irregularities can be mapped by epithelial mapping which uh, dr chitra and dr fogla and the others had talked about earlier and in post refractive surgery you can look at the decentered ablation zones and central islands which you can treat with ptk and uh, shine plug based topography obviously now is the gold standard anterior segment oct would tell you the depth of lesion localization in recurrent corneal erosion will tell you about the epithelium there and the epithelial mapping will tell you the same but of course as you can see in this picture the climatic droplet dystrophy is cause a lot of posterior shadowing so you may not know the depth of the scar you can see the lasik flap even years after the lasik surgery and you can see any epithelial downgrowth you can see the layer where there's the band shaped keratopathy etc so what would you do in the surgical planning anesthesia is extremely important mostly done under topical but we have done several children for uh, granular dystrophy where you find that you would need to use sedation but in sedation we find again the patient is very very uncooperative so we have used propofol that is intravenous anesthesia that is called tiva and you cannot use gas based anesthesia in your refractive surgery suit which will interfere with your machine working it is the logistics are the refractive surgery suit may not be very big and there you have to have your anesthetists then you have your uh, para monitoring uh, uh, equipment the boils apparatus etc so all these are logistical stuff which you we found were a lot of difficulty and even under propofol anesthesia the patient could suddenly move you really need a little deeper anesthesia even at the age of 12 or 13 years we found this kind of a problem because corneal opacity in the amblyopiogenic age you would like to treat early and uh, the type of ptk that you can do can be focal broad multifocal and pre the ptk would you do a trans ptk or would you do an epithelial debridement would you do it manually would you do it with alcohol then uh, that depends upon the if the epithelium is very regular you can do a trans also and if the epithelium is irregular you would preferably like to debride it and uh, you can use masking agents which we'll talk about later 
Each pulse abrades 0.25 microns. 50 pulses uh, can induce one diopter of hyperopia. So the Munnerlein's formula tells you that the dioptric change is three into ablation depth in microns by ablation depth in millimeters. There is more shift if the ablation depth is more, and it's inversely proportional to the diameter of the optical zone. So probably you would like a larger diameter I mean, of ablation zone. In the Visex machine, which we have, 2 to 6.5 ml of circular ablation spot can be there. Or you can have a rectangular ablation of 0.6 to 6.5 mm with a repetition rate, preferably of 10 hertz. So as we said, epithelial debridement with mechanical or 20% alcohol. Masking agent should not be too thin, they run off, or too thick, which will cover the peaks and the valleys and not be very effective. So sodium hyaluronate, methyl cellulose, or dextran can be used. Trans can be used uh, in certain circumstances, like PED, flap complications, recurrent erosions. Large area PTKs we do for diffuse opacity, scars, dystrophy. Better to have a transition zone, and there is more treatment to steeper areas. We have found that we can when there is a large area of the dystrophy, central obviously is the most important. When you see you haven't covered the peripheral area, if the area is more than 6.5, you can use rectangular spots in the periphery. Shoot and check has been told by Christopher Rapuano that every time you do, you can take the patient back to the slit lamp, see the ablation is adequate or not, and get the patient back. Obviously, a little cumbersome, and you need to have your slit lamp closer to your refractive suit. Focal smoothening can be done in cases like Salzman's nodules. Personally, I have just peeled off the Salzman's nodules, but uh, number of pulses you can calculate, that is, is equal to elevation in microns into four, and you can use smaller spot size, 0. 0.6 to 2 millimeters. You have one minute remaining, ma'am. Sure. And multifocal PTK can be done in persistent epithelial defects. Mitomycin C, we found when we used uh, in earlier cases that uh, the subepithelial fibrosis, irregular astigmatism is not there. It can reduce recurrences in anterior stromal pathologies. The uh, indications of PTK are recurrent erosions, traumatic cases, uh, which can be traumatic or basement membrane dystrophy, found to be more useful in traumatic rather than epithelial basement membrane dystrophies. In corneal dystrophies like GDLD or uh, these bucklers or anterior variant, we have found in one case, in this child, we have done recurrent, uh, that's the advantage of the PTK that you can do in recurrent cases. Here you can see, that there's a clear area, and this is after the recurrence has occurred. Sometimes the recurrence can be more, uh, it can be much more than the primary. This picture is of the father of this child. We can see that the surface topography really improves after an additional PRK along with the PTK, which because of each PTK, the child had more and more hyperopia till I discussed it with Dr. Fogla, and he said a PRK would help. In band-shaped keratopathy in calcific, you would prefer an epithelial debridement prior to, and you can even use EDTA and AMG post. In corneal scars, it can just debulk the scars, and superficial scars up to 100 microns, it can be effective. Fuller's keratopathy, symptomatic cases, it can be helpful, can reduce the pain. Infectious keratitis, this has been described. In keratoconus, as it was being discussed earlier, transepithelial PTK of the Creton protocol, followed by the C3R. In refractive surgery complications also it has been described. Pre-cataract surgery, we have treated the superficial opacities, like in this poster we presented last year at AIOS. It has been found that a lot, I'm sorry, it's not very clear, but the astigmatism had reduced and we could calculate the IOL power prior to that. Complications are of course there with post-op discomfort, haze, irregular astigmatism, induced hyperopic shift, recurrence of the disease in HSV, and also infections can occur. In conclusion, it's a minimally invasive, repeatable procedure with faster recovery, but a lot of preoperative planning is required once you know the etiology of the uh, scar and the opacity, the depth and the extent and the refractive status. So this was an excellent article, Rashmi is not here, of Rashmi and uh, Jagdish and uh, Praveen and Christopher Rapuano, which was my uh, major source of reference. Thank you for the patient listening. Yeah, nice talk, Dr. Uma. It was uh, very informative. But just uh, uh, to summarize it, summarize it uh, Namrata, could you tell us what would be the hyperopic shift we should, if, uh, we should expect and how do you plan your correction? Of course, she did tell about the amount of uh, refractive shift with number of pulses, but grossly, when you oh, do. I think uh, fine-tuning of that is really not possible to do because uh, it is 
quite gross. And I think when you're doing a PTK, it is more for therapeutic indications rather than for uh, refractive indications, at least 95% uh, of the times. And that is your, uh, you know, the goal uh, that is you want to remove the pathology. I think this is a, a technique which has not been utilized really too much. I mean, it has a great potential. Uh, we've uh, published a review article uh, in survey of ophthalmology, uh, with the entire uh, gamut of indications, complications, etc. And we've also done randomized studies where in cases of bullous kerat keratopathy, we compared AMT with vis 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 PTK. And we used PTK for Salzman nodular degeneration and even found that if Salzman nodular degeneration was superficial, PTK did better than in those cases where, you know, you would have to do some other corneal procedure. So I think it has a great potential. It is a surgery which spares the uh, uh, corneal transplantation, at least the sal superficial anterior lamellar keratoplasty uh, kind of a thing in most of the cases and should be a go-to procedure for corneal pathologies, which are superficial. Only thing is, like you said, it is not, it is not possible to, you know, predict how much it does induce hyperopia and how much hyperopia it will induce. That is, that is a, you know, challenge uh, to note. And if the surface is going to be an irregular surface, uh, uh, Dr. Moyle, uh, would you look at doing using masking uh, techniques or would you like to do a manual debridement of and treat? So I think when the surface is very irregular, you debride the epithelium first and then use the masking agent to make sure that you get a uniform uh, smoothing of the surface after that. Dr. Rajesh, your thoughts? I, I, I agree with most of the points that have been made till now. And this is not a procedure that you perform very frequently. Yes. So, you know, you can't really have uh, a, a, the, the same uh, protocol for each and every patient. So some patients, you have the epithelium nicely masking all the underlying irregularities. Then you use the epithelium itself as a masking agent. But sometimes if the epithelium is abnormal, then you debride and then you use a masking agent. Like I, I love to use uh, carboxymethyl cellulose. I just put a drop of it and then I ablate in, you know, series of about 30 microns. And, and I keep looking at it, how the surface looks. So there is no... You cannot go to the end point of achieving a completely clear cornea. The objective is to get a clear visual axis and try to preserve as much as stroma as uh, possible. But uh, doing the pre-op anterior segment OCT does give you a clue as to how deep you are going to ablate, and then it, you can program it, program your treatment accordingly. Yes. Anything else to add? Yes, Namata. In cases like granular dystrophy, for instance, and if it is superficial, you do a PTK, at least you are deferring the corneal transplantation procedure by a few years. It recurs. I mean, there is no way it is not going to recur, but it will recur. Uh, and when it impinges on the visual axis, maybe after two years, and then you, you know, right. you repeat again. So it just buys time. Thanks a lot. And uh, lovely talk, Dr. Umar. So we go on to our next speaker, Dr. Vardhaman Kankaria, uh, who's again... Uh, a very popular cataract, refractive, and cornea surgeon, and from Pune, and uh, both nationally and internationally known. And he's going to talk on a, another very interesting talk: use of combined procedures with CXL in management of keratoconus. Yeah, thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, is my uh, slide yeah, share visible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, at the onset, I would like to thank. Uh, Dr. Chitra, ma'am, for uh, uh, the kind invitation. And it's been a great learning session so far. Uh, friends, what I'm going to talk to you about is going to be combination of collagen cross-linking uh, with variety of modalities uh, to improve the visual rehabilitation of our keratoconus patients. Uh, this all combined procedures together are called as CXL plus approach or collagen cross-linking plus approach. Uh, we all know that uh, keratoconus is a progressive thinning disorder which results in corneal uh, irregularity and resulting in irregular corneal astigmatism that leads to visual distortion and poor quality of vision for all of our patients. It is very, uh, it has been well proven that uh, collagen cross-linking has been uh, successful in stabilizing keratoconus in long term 
but can we achieve more than just stabilization? So let's look at uh, Swati, one of our first patients who came to us with progressive keratoconus, a uh, low best corrected visual acuity of 2080 and a moderate keratoconus, as you can see. She had a relatively thick cornea. So she underwent a standard resident protocol and at five years of cross-linking, as you can see, she actually had a very stable cornea as seen in differential map and relatively flattened cornea, which made us very happy as doctors. So although as doctors, we were extremely happy, but Swati was not. And the resultant, uh, the reason was that she still had poor best corrected visual acuity and she was non-tolerant to contact lenses. Then we realized that many of these post CXL patients do not achieve good functional vision, especially when they cannot tolerate contact lenses. And that is especially because of irregular astigmatism. So current uh, basically uh, therapy has to be both, uh, that is not only stabilization, but also uh, improving the visual rehabilitation of these patients by a combined approach. And this has been coined as CXL plus by one of my mentors, Josh Kimionis. So as we can see, uh, collagen cross-linkage plus is a combination of collagen cross-linkage with variety of approaches such as transepithelial PTK, topographic added PRK, uh, fakic intraocular lenses, as well as intracorneal ring segments. And you have to really uh, see and justify each and every case by case approach. So this is the first case. Uh, if you look at the 21 year old uh, patient who came to us with a relatively good best corrected visual acuity of 2040 uh, and a minimal to moderate keratoconus, a relative thickness of 483 microns. Uh, so in back in 2009, our group led by Kimionis had uh, demonstrated that if we combine topographic guided PRK with collagen cross-linking at the same sitting, this combination therapy can be capable of offering patients good functional vision as well as stabilization of keratoconus together. This became very popular as Athens protocol. Further on, we published a long-term comparison between this Athens protocol in ophthalmology in back in 2013, where we uh, did a 30i randomized uh, study between a uh, PRKCXL, which was the Athens protocol, as against the Dresden protocol alone, and looking at variety of uh, outcomes. And we demonstrated a statistically uh, better outcomes with uh, the Athens protocol for both keratometric indices as well as the visual outcomes. Uh, you can clearly see the visual topographic stabilization and improvement that it brings in. But it is very important to note that this uh, approach is not a refractive correction, but it is just to improve the therapeutic anterior surface and minimum pachymetry of 450 microns and uh, less than 50 microns of ablation is essential to look at this option. Let us look at, uh, so with this patient, we did Athens protocol. As you can see, the patient uh, demonstrated much better topographic outcomes and the vision improved from 2040 to 2020. Uh, many patients have actually corneal thickness of which cannot be sufficient for Athens protocol because of very thin corneas. Therefore, the next approach was to see if we cannot do a topographic added PRK, can we actually have a epithelial removal technique in such a way that this technique itself helps us to improve the visual outcomes of collagen cross-linkage. So to look at that, uh, we looked at a study by Reinstein et al, who had demonstrated that the epithelium has a donut shape pattern in keratoconus, which is a localized thinnest at the apex of the cone. And therefore we have, our group had hypothesized that if we use this differential epithelial uh, mask agent, uh, epithelial thickness as the masking agent and use PTK to evaporate uh, this epithelium by about 50 microns of PTK. Uh, and then we can not only take out the apex of the, uh, the epithelium, but also uh, a bit of smoothening at the apex of the cone. Uh, we first published one case report. Uh, this was in European Journal. And in that week, you can actually see that there was this topographic uh, flattening uh, with the PTK. And thereafter, we demonstrated in a comparative study between this approach, which was the PTK and CXL combination therapy, which is now uh, coined as a Cretan protocol because it originated from the University of Crete and versus the manual epithelial debridement. And we uh, published that the Cretan protocol demonstrated statistically better visual as well as the topographic indices in long term uh, with none of the patients progressing. Uh, if you look at this patient, this patient had a very high astigmatism of about 15 diopters and a low corneal thickness of 420 microns. So of course, he, this patient is not suitable for Athens as well as Cretan protocol. So for such patients of very high irregular astigmatism, it is important that we actually use approach with the help of intracorneal ring segments. Uh, 
uh, with intracorneal ring segments, which work as passive spacing agents in the periphery of the cornea and, and not only flattens the central cornea, but also improves the topography. So this can be combined with the same sitting or in two different sittings with collagen cross-linkage. In this particular patient, uh, we used uh, in, in tax, and as you can see, his topography had improved from 15 diopters astigmatism to eight diopters astigmatism, and the visual acuity also demonstrated a base corrected vision of improvement from 2000 to 20 and 40. So this approach demonstrates the use of intax with very high irregular astigmatism. Now we have looked at the cases with mild astigmatism, moderate irregular astigmatism, and also severe irregular astigmatism. So what about the eyes with very high myopia, but a mild irregular astigmatism? And we see a lot of such patients who are especially having central cones such as that. Look at this 27 year old female patient who came with a best corrected visual acuity of 2030, which was very good, but very high myopic astigmatism of minus 12 diopters of sphere, sphere and minus 4.50 diopters of cylindrical numbers. Of course, this patient was not suitable for any of the other laser combined approaches. Therefore, we performed a collagen cross linkage. And after six months of stability, we performed a toric ICL implant. With toric ICL, the patient's vision improved to 20, uh, 40 uncorrected, and the patient was extremely happy. So it is very important with this combination approaches of CXL plus that you can actually individualize the combination of uh, collagen cross linkage with topographic added PTK, uh, with topographic added PRK, uh, which is called as Athens protocol, transepithelial PTK, intacts, as well as fakie lenses from case to case manner. CXL plus is definitely the way to the future, a method which offers a complete treatment of not only stabilization, but also improvement in functional vision of these patients. And this is very, very important that we customize the approach in such a way that we have a complete solution for our patients in the form of uh, designing these approaches. So uh, along with the Cretan now, we have recently submitted our paper for what is called as a uh, Cretan Plus protocol, in which we are doing a transepithelial PTK with a win minimum uh, PRK approach to improve uh, these patients where they have insufficient thickness for topographic added PRK. So I think once the paper is published, I'll definitely share that with you all. Thank you again uh, to Dr. Chitra ma'am and everybody else for the kind attention. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Vadman. That was an excellent talk. Uh, like, uh, uh, do how many of us do a topo guided PRK with cross linking uh, in this uh, panel? Many of us. Yes. Yeah, there are quite a few of us. Then, then the first question I have to ask is: Would you do a topo guided treatment if the BCBA is six six, or only if the BCBA is compromised? Would you do a topo guided PRK with cross linking? Any of you could answer. Ma'am, if the patient is happy with the quality of vision and uh, the BCVA is 66, I think probably I'll go ahead and just do a Cretan protocol for this patient rather than doing a full-fledged topographic guided treatment. Because many times with topo guided treatment, uh, you have this uh, kind of ablation where it steepens the flatter zone and it flattens the steeper zone. Many of the times you induce a lot of uh, ametropias also along with that. So I think if the vision is 66, patient is happy with the quality, I'll just do a Cretan protocol for this patient. Dr. Rajesh, would you think differently? I would I... not do anything if the patient is happy. Uh, yeah, that's with true. Vision yeah. and is uh, you know able to see very well. Uh -huh. I I would follow him up for progression of keratoconus, and if there is progression, maybe I'll consider treatment options. Uh, I have burnt my fingers over the years, last fifteen years that I've been doing cross linking and a combination of laser cross linking. I've had patients who were plano for three years. And then later on, they started becoming hyperopic for the cases that I've done a combined a PRK with cross-linking. So I think there are a lot of unanswered questions. And so if there is uh, like, like basically if the patient is not requiring it and he's happy with his vision, I don't think we should be running around and trying to do these corneas. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll agree with Dr. Fogler. If it is non-progressive, I mean, first you have to look at this progression. If it is not progressing, I think it is best not to touch a 6-6 patient anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no. That, uh, if no it is way, 6-6, I think, should not be touched at all. I mean, yeah. no, uh, if it is uh, progressing or it is a uh, patient is going to uh, have pregnancy and uh, those kind of issues, I think it is uh, knowing that uh, uh, doing a good topo-guided treatment <clears throat> cross-linking is definitely going to regularize any topographic irregularity too. I don't think we should uh, 
categorize that way if there if there is progression there's no progression yes no so anyway the other question is um, if there is progression and but the refractive error is small would you still do only a cx cell or would you think that this is the time when you could knock off that refractive error and would you do a topo guided uh, treatment and do a cxl would you use a refractive cylinder as the correction or would you use a topographic cylinder and axis um ma'am if it is i mean uh, before i think dr namrata ma'am wants to say something first yes. no, I, i don't want to say something you say <laughs> <laughs> so basically uh, no, i think if you want me to say my take on this would be the same what rajesh said if it's a very small uh, refractive error then i will not you know go running chasing it i will again look for you know progression in that case no if there is progression we are not talking of not there is progression then collagen cross linking would be done immediately but i would not be very uh, enthusiastic or very uh, what do you say aggressive about doing a topo guided procedure on that patient ma'am because uh, there is very very uh, i mean there are i think enough literature about very uh, long term flattening effects some of these patients have flattened to 4 5 6 8 diopters so if we actually try to knock off anything uh, there is a chance that the patient can become uh, aggressively hyperopic in the future uh, maybe again in this case uh, my always balanced approach is if it is progressing i prefer a cretan protocol if i have to combine it rather than doing anything else yeah i think those earlier studies so more with the standard cross linking with the accelerated cross linking where are we seeing in this last decade patients having excessive flattening i am somehow in variance with what you all are saying neither are we aggressive about doing it but if there is a significant refractive error moderately significant if it is very significant we would think of looking at intags if it's moderate then uh, topographic uh, asymmetry is there then when you're doing a, a accelerated cross linking and a regularization all these patients are doing well in this forum i didn't want to don't want us to go back thinking that that is a cancelled approach at all no it's watching a patient a cancelled approach it. but but like i said that this is not like the first treatment of choice when you see the patient yeah. like for even for me if i can fix something by putting a intax i would look at that first because that's a reversible procedure and that's something that you can you know undo what you have done but when you do a laser ablation and you are removing tissue from the cornea then my primary objective is to try and address the astigmatism that the patient has so it is not like a, a refractive correction it's more like to reduce the coma or the higher order ablation that the patient has because of which the patient is unable to see with the spectacles and it's imperative that all these patients should receive a contact lens i see a lot of patients who have never tried contact lens and they are just looking for laser treatment and they want lasik and some of them after i have you know at least have them had a contact lens trial have been so happy with the quality of vision i don't think there is any procedure that can match the quality of vision that you can get with a rigid contact lens absolutely so i think if the patient cannot wear the contact lens and then he is he understands the risks involved with the procedure then we go ahead it's an option but it's not the first line of option in my patients when i treat but definitely i have used it i have used it in combination with cross linking accelerated cross linking in combination with intax but these are patients who understand the risks involved with the procedure and you know if there is an unpredictable outcome and i never do both eyes at the same time i've had a doctor a, a, a medical student who my treated one eye a topographic guided prk and cross linking and i told her we'll wait for some time see the response and in that eye she ended up with you know plus one day after hyperopia a year later so the other eye we just did cross linking and we did not did not touch with the topographic guided laser uh shreyas are you there do you want to add anything i think he has not got connected dr vikas you have anything to add you have to unmute yourself yeah i think um, uh, same if the patient has i what i see is what is the best corrected visual acuity with glasses So, if this best best corrected visual acuity with glasses is six 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 nine, and he's happy with that vision, nothing. So, and then next thing I ask is, is he happy with his contact lenses? Again, if he's happy with contact lenses, nothing. Then index only for generally for my me only for post LASIK ectasia or who has a steepening only in the inferior two eccentric, and you put only one ring. 
for cross linking and uh, uh, tgprk so what i generally do is if the patient has low best corrected visual acuity say uh, say uh, 636 624 for those only i generally use so so i'm i think i'm quite conservative on the, those that trend so uh, people who are on the cornea side are always more conservative Chitra, as compared to people who why, are, why so we are on the subject. I, I, I why? want uh, Dr. Shreya Shramurthy to use both cornea and refractive. I don't no, know why no. he's absent. Chitra, Chitra definitely you have, have, No, everybody is here cornea and refractive. Mm. <laughs> Chitra, you definitely your group has a much larger experience, experience yeah. in doing these patients or maybe the volume of patients yeah. that you've treated. Maybe once you have a larger volume and you have see, see better results, you yeah. have greater confidence in doing these yeah. treatments. But at the same time, let me disclose, I have now a series of about eight patients. Out of that, four of them are doctors. And they have had cross-linking done 12 to 14 years before with the classical resident protocol. And, they are, and all of them have exactly the same clinical feature of a non-inflammatory stromal tissue loss in the thinnest point where they have lost almost the entire corneal stroma resulting in requiring a corneal transplant. And this could be because there, there is, and the histopathology shows total loss of keratocytes. And this could be something that we are dealing with that there is, the collagen has lost its ability to regenerate. So that, you know, the turnover of collagen is not happening. So the existing collagen, when it, when it lyses, you, there is no new collagen being laid and you just have the decimates, the pre decimates layer and the epithelium. So in between the stroma is just melting away and it looks like a punched out defect. So it's not like a progressive thinning. So this is something, uh, because we saw all these cases, now we are trying to compile it. This is something worrisome. And when I put this in one of the group, eight other cornea specialists came up with a similar cases that they have seen. So I'm pretty sure if you go back, maybe you may have also come across a patient with very abnormal corneal thinning, post cross-linking. They all end up with very flat, cornea becoming very flat with four or five diopters, hyperopia. And then the, this part of the cornea, the, the central haze, you start seeing this stromal loss. That is something to bring up because I, I'm pretty sure if, if this is it, then all the patients who have had the Dresden protocol, we may be seeing a much larger volume of these patients, these complications. Dr. Sir, Fogler, do you feel that the, the MMC also we use in these cases, this has anything to do with this because... No, no, these are not, these are not uh, topographic guided PRK. These are just uh, cross-linking. Okay. Conventional that cross, is cross, cross protocol. They are all done in 2009, 2010. And some of them have been done at, you know, at institutes like SN at LVP. So there, it's not like they have done peripherally. So the machine was at fault. So they've all been done at, uh, you know, tertiary care centers. So I'm pretty sure they followed the exact protocol. But uh, the, the, the hypothesis I have is we know that the collagen turnover takes about eight to 10 years when the new collagen is being laid. Maybe that original cross-linking has, the, the stroma has, the stromal collagen has lost its ability to regenerate. So now what's happening is the old collagen in the thinnest area as it's dying or, or, or it's getting absorbed, you, you don't have the new collagen being laid. And so the cornea is just uh, thinning away and it's melting. But there is no inflammation. So it's a non-inflammatory melt. Rajesh, um, I also have seen a patient recently with a similar clinical picture, procedure done with Dresden protocol eight, nine years ago, who has developed progressive thinning. The question is, I'm not very sure. Um, at least I have not observed a similar change. Maybe we should go back and look at our cases. Do we see a similar change in the accelerated protocol as well? Because we, here, none of, these, none of, them, none of these cases have had accelerated protocol. They've all had the classic conventional. protocol. Probably even the conventional may not have been done in a regular manner and uh, they wouldn't have followed the protocol of a conventional too, for all you know, in those well, early accelerated days. Is, accelerated is more recent, so we'll still yeah. have to wait for what will happen after accelerated. Don't know. Yeah. Don't know. And I think, uh, like I always felt in children, if you do collagen cross-linking, then the chances of, uh, you know, they progress despite that. But in adults, like you are saying, that uh, the collagen is quite shocked and it completely just disappears. Yes, yes. So thanks a lot. We shall now go on to our uh, next talk, leaving uh, the controversies afloat. Uh, <laughs> we have Dr. Harshavardhan. Uh, uh, who's going to who's again a, a consultant cornea refractive and cataract surgeon from Fortis Hospital uh, Vasi Mumbai 
and he is going to talk on a very relevant topic various indications and application techniques for amniotic membrane grafting on to you dr harper harshvan yeah uh hello everyone uh, a completely different topic from the previous one uh, amniotic membrane transplantation uh, at the outset i would like to thank uh, ais and arc for this opportunity especially chitra madam there are no financial disclosures uh, the global amniotic product market has is going to reach to uh, 1 billion dollars by 2026 at a rate of 8.2% per year and it is mainly powered by uh, surgical wound repair and the ever increasing indications in ophthalmology we all know it started with dr davis with skin transplantation uh, in uh, 1910 and then by dr d roth for conjunctival reconstruction and later revived by dr sang et al after yuan battles report for uh, stem cell therapy uh, it forms part of the fetal membrane the inner one is amnion outer chorion and it has five layers cuboid epithelium basement membrane stroma has compact layer fibroblast layer and spongy layer it has important properties like anti inflammatory anti fibrotic epithelial proliferation differentiation adhesion anti microbial anti angiogenic and analgesic and it is non immunogenic in addition it is a source of stem cells it is a biological biocompatible scaffold and anatomical barrier allowing gas exchange in short it is easily available translucent non immunogenic but it is a biological membrane and non standardized and tectonically not very strong and can transmit infections the alternative stemnotic membrane are conjunctiva fascia mucous membrane pericardium and tenon scapsin it is procured by separation from the chorion placed on microcellulose paper cut into 4 by 4 cm strips each amnion can give about 30 strips it is then preserved in uh, uh, modified eagles medium with glycerol and stored at minus 80 degrees by cryo preservation there are other techniques of preparation preservation like freeze drying heat drying and uh, the donor is screened for uh, blood borne diseases this is how we separate the amnion from the chorion before it is cut into pieces uh, this paper says that there is a change in the properties of the membrane based on the type of preparation and preservation this could be the uh, the membrane could become thin uh, friable uh, papery or thick and uniform and also the transparency can be affected in addition the biological properties can get affected because of these uh, preparation techniques and it has been found that the augmented dried membrane is much more superior to the cryo preserved membrane in short today we have amniotic membrane in the form of stem cells as fresh frozen dried decellularized micronized amniotic membrane powder uh, scaffold uh, amniotic membrane drops fillers and all sorts of things for treatment and non ophthalmologically it can be used for treating skin burns diabetic and venous ulcers abdominal hernias vaginal repairs closure of pericardium and a barrier to prevent surgical adhesions in ophthalmology uh, non commercially it is used as a fresh membrane uh, after delivery or as a cryo preserved membrane as was described before and uh, it can also be used in icu settings uh, uh, around iv tubing or a conformer or with glue and with a uh, amsterter ring which was in, uh, recently innovated by dr baskar commercially it is available as procara which is a cryo preserved with a soft contact lens conformer ring freeze dried as visioamtrix heat dried as ambiodis and omnigen which is vacuum dried with thialos and is supposed to have better biological properties uh, these are the various membranes procara the amsterter and the omnigen on the right procara is more popular it is available as procara slim procara classic and procara plus uh, the more severe is the indication the more thicker the procara we use this is how it is inserted first in the upper eyelid and then we pull the lower eyelid and place it inside so coming to the ophthalmic uses the amniotic membrane is basically used as a substrate for growth of epithelial cells uh, as a tectonic support for perforation and thinning as a replacement to cover large corneal and conjunctival defects and to reduce inflammation fibrosis angiogenesis and infection so what are the various techniques of transplant so there are three major techniques inlay which is either single layered or multi layered onlay or overlay and a, <coughs> sorry combinatorial or a sandwich technique in inlay the basic thing is that the deceased tissue is removed and the amniotic membrane replaces the deceased tissue with the basement membrane facing upwards so what happens is that the host epithelium now grows on this basement membrane 
the disease uh, the laminating membranes becomes part or rem gets remodeled into the host tissue and therefore it gives its tensile strength uh, if the uh, defect is deep we use multiple pieces of membrane over uh, each other and then finally put a single membrane in this technique the entire membrane is sutured within the defect with the help of 10-0 ethylon radial sutures the second is onlay which is like a, a patch it is used as a biological dressing basically and uh, the membrane is placed with the epithelium facing down it basically covers the defect it doesn't get become part of the host tissue it falls off after 7 to 10 days or has to be removed and it gives good uh, anti-inflammatory anti-fibrotic and mechanical protection in this the membrane is sutured around the epithelial defect with 10-0 uh, uh, ethylon per string sutures and the third one is a combination technique we use the advantages of both the inlay is used uh, to allow the epithelium to grow and provide tectonic strength while the onlay covers the growing epithelium and provides itself it uh, protection. Uh, the example being the Acer technique described by Professor Dua who was also my mentor long back and uh, uh, the main difference uh, how to identify the stromal side is by using cotton buds or a small forceps and we can get sticky vitreous like strands coming on the stromal side or we can even stain them with tripen blue or lizamin green. So what are the indications based on the various parts of the eye? In cornea, it can be used to treat uh, persistent epithelial defects, ulcers, thinning, perforations, uh, epithelial lesions like recurrent coronal erosion, scars, Salzman nodular degeneration and tumors. It can be used as a pressure patch to prevent epithelial ingrowth. It can be used for painful bullous keratopathy, limbal stem cell deficiency, we can uh, do stem cell transplant and bacterial and herpetic keratitis can be treated uh, with this. Conjunctiva, it can be used to uh, reconstruct ocular surface after removal of conjunctival tumors, scars, treating simbilepheron, after pterygium surgery as a replacement for conjunctiva in case we don't have adequate conjunctiva and in conjunctiva colasis. As an anti-inflammatory, it can be used in acute chemical burns, thermal burns, acute Steven Johnson syndrome, PUK, dry eye and PRK, post-PRK. In oculoplastics, it is used for anophthalmia and socket reconstruction, phonics formation in OCP and SJS, covering of orbital implants, entropion and eyelid repair, post-tumor removal, corneal patch to protect against radioactive plaques, and in cryptophthalmos repair. In glaucoma, it can be used for bleb revision, over-filtering blebs, leaking blebs, filtering under the, uh, it can be used under the scleral flap to reduce fibrosis and as a patch graft during, uh, to cover drainage devices. And in miscellaneous, it can be used to as a substrate for ex vivo expansion of limbal and mesenchymal stem cells in strabismus surgery to reduce the fibrosis around the muscles and to in retinal surgery also it is being used for macular hole and retinal tear plugging. So in most of the indications, we use the inlay graphs. So basically the corneal, conjunctival and even the glaucoma oculoplastic indications, we uh, employ the inlay graph. The onlay graft is basically used for acute chemical burns in the first uh, seven days uh, to reduce the inflammation and give pain relief to the patient. In uh, cicatrizing conjunctivitis in acute SJS, it is used to reduce the corneal haze and formation of syndlephora have been reduced according to studies. And in dry eye disease, it is used as a level four intervention as, remaining, as per DUS protocol uh, and uh, in recurrent corneal erosions. In a combination, it is used as limbal stem cell transplantation. It can be used for perforations, shields, ulcer, and in chemical burns. Complications include hematoma under the membrane, subepithelial membrane, which is retained, causing opacification, premature degradation of the membrane, microbial infections, uh, calcification, white plaques, and inconsistent results as because of lack of standardization. So these are the various examples. In Steven Johnson, we cover the entire ocular surface along with the skin. Uh, in uh, perforations, we use a sandwich technique, uh, sorry, not a sandwich technique, the uh, combination technique where uh, gas is also injected in the anterior chamber to plug the perforation. In pterygium, we replace the conjunctiva and the epithelium then grows over it. Uh, in uh, uh, here, the prokara is being used to treat herpetic keratitis. Here, omnigen is being used to treat neurotrophic keratitis. This is a case where we used the sandwich technique to treat limbal stem cell deficiency. The first membrane was the inlay, which was secured with glue, which formed part of the corneal stroma. The, the stem cells, the explants were placed by the sled technique. And then we placed the uh, onlay graft, uh, which acts like a protection and the stem cells grow inside like as if growing in an incubator. And this is what we get, uh, opaque cornea clearing up to 6-6 vision five years down the line. 
uh, this is another case of grade six chemical burns with skin involvement. Here we use it as an onlay in the first seven days. Uh, it helped to reduce the inflammation. It helped to reduce the symptoms of the patient. First spring sutures being applied and the excessive membrane is then used to cover uh, the skin uh, lesions, which are also there in this, uh, in this case. So these are the advances. Uh, we have ultra thin amniotic membranes available today, with, which help in epithelial growth in a better way and also give transparency to the cornea. These are photo cross linkable amniotic membrane hydrogels, that, which give good tectonic support and they have been used in surgical indications. And this is nanofiber reinforced decellarized membrane and a synthetic polymer amniotic membrane, which helps the limbal stem cells to grow better because they are retained well. The membrane is retained well in the eye and the stem cells can grow. So in short, it is a, it is a very good innovation to reduce inflammation, promote healing, give symptomatic relief, good alternative to conjunctiva mucous membrane, non-allogenic, easily available. However, it has variable properties, can give inconsistent re results, can be stored up to two years, can transmit diseases, can be used sutureless in emergency in clinic settings, can be used inlay, onlay, or both, non-commercially available as fresh, frozen, commercially as dried and augmented with superior biological properties, and the recent advances have enhanced its properties and applications. Uh, these are the references. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Harshwardhan. That was a lovely talk. We'll just take one question because we are running short of time. In a persistent epithelial defect, when would you think of using an uh, AMG or when would you think of doing a tarsoraphy or when would you think of using serum drops? Uh, Dr. Radhika, do you want to answer that? I will. Thank you. It's a very pertinent question. And, uh, you know, one will have to do a stepwise approach. Uh, first, you know, try to find out the cause for the persistent epithelial defect and uh, look at any associated factors like if there are any tracheatic lashes, dry eye, etc. And um, uh, personally, I feel that if it's a neurotrophic ulcer, one could first try autologous serum drops if you have confocal microscopy and you find that there is an activated activation of the um, uh, keratocytes or if you find that the nerve fibers are showing uh, features of uh, inflammation. And autologous serum drops is a good way to start. However, so if it's a completely neurotrophic cornea with uh, hardly any keratocytes, then one may have to go for AMG straight away. And uh, autologous serum, uh, you, you usually will give it a trial of about a week or two by then you'll come to know if there is any effect appearing or not and if there's absolutely no change then you can go ahead with the next step of an amniotic membrane so they do complement each other it's after all amniotic membrane as he said is um, it is a surgical procedure and it is always having that slight slight very very rare risk of uh, infection transmission which you cannot ignore <laughs> So if you can give autologous serum therapy and it works, it's always uh, what you would like to do first. We also go one step ahead at times to do neurotization in such cases uh, after amniotic membrane fails. So I had just one question about this case. We had a thermal injury, firecracker. One eye is already gone. There is an implant placed there. This is the only eye which is seeing one meter. Uh, there is panas growing superiorly. The lower part of the cornea appears clear through which the patient is able to see something and uh, the central cornea shows scarring. My question is whether just removing the panels, placing an amniotic membrane would be better or taking stem cells from the inferior part and doing a slit would be better or taking stem cells from uh, his... Should we uh, take this question after the next talk, which is going to be on uh, slit and optimizing outcomes? So we'll take this, definitely yeah. we'll take this example at that time. Okay. Yeah, and Vikas will answer the question because he has to answer this question. He's going to give that talk. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So we look forward. This was a wonderful talk, uh, Dr. Harshwardhan. We go on to our next speaker, Dr. Vikas Mittal, who's again a, a cornea surgeon, cornea and cataract surgeon, and of course, refractive too. And he is from LG uh, Institute, Ambala. And he's going to be telling us about sim uh, simple limbal uh, epithelial transplantation. Pearls for optimal outcomes. Thanks so much. Uh, I'll share my screen. So hope it is visible. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, thanks so much, AIC, uh, ARC, and Dr. Brahmurti for giving me this opportunity. Uh, the topic given to me is that how do we have an optimal outcomes after SLET? 
So first of all, we'll have to understand that what are these optimal outcomes? So if a cornea or eye, something like this becomes something like this, this will be a desired outcome. If we can have cosmetic, structural, as well as functional improvement after slit in an LSCD patient, it will be a desirable outcome. Firecracker burn, severe limbal, severe LSCD, after slit, you can see shining cornea, clear center, patient can see excellent outcome. Even if the cornea is not transparent, even if it is opaque, if we can have a surface, stable surface, we can do a penetrating keratoplasty or uh, any laminar keratoplasty later. Comparatively, milder stem cell cell deficiency will have obviously will have a better outcomes. But for these results, how, go, how, how long these results are going to stay? So what are the long-term effects? This boy was, underwent slit uh, around 12 years, rather exactly 12 years from now, he had a tuna injury. And all these 12 years, the surface has been stable and child is using contact lens pretty decently. You can see even for the long term as well. So what are optimal outcomes? The epithelium on the cornea should be corneal phenotype. And there should be no uh, ocular surface issues like persistent epithelial defects, inflammation, and these results which we achieve should be long lasting. This is what the optimal outcomes is. Little backgrounds, what happens in these eyes is this beautiful structure, which is a barrier, the limbus, this is missing. There can be many reasons for that. Most commonly in our setup, we see chemical burns. What do we do? If the limbus is damaged, we have to restore it. And at present, SLET is the technique of choice for stem cell transplant, and it is followed all over the globe. Thanks to Dr. Sangwan, who invented this technique, and we don't have to depend on stem cell lab uh, these days. What we do is take a limbus uh, tissue, and we do an in vivo cultivation in the patient, other eye which has a limbal stem cell deficiency. The individual limbal paces gives rise to epithelium, and over a period of two to three weeks, it covers the whole of the uh, cornea that, that we had shown in our uh, study as well. This, pheno this corneal epithelium has been proven to be of corneal phenotype only. So now the question comes that how, what all we do clinically so that we have a best possible outcomes. I have divided into three headings. So let's see what we need to do before, during, and after the surgery. So before surgery. I remember a call in the middle of my OPD. I got a call from my ophthalm friend. He said, because you had shown me slit uh, videos the other day in a, one of the talk, I've got a patient and I want to do a slit. Please send me videos once again. I said, okay, so can you share the preoperative photographs of your patient that you want to do a slit in? He sent that. And these were the photographs. You can see dry, keratinized surface, hostile atmosphere. How will those, you know, limbal stem cells will survive here. So dry, keratinized, not at all. Even if the eyes are wet, if there's a continuous inflammation in the form of OCP or continuous mechanical insult in the form of lid margin keratin, these are the eyes where you'll have a suboptimal outcomes after slit. The best eyes are unilateral LSCD and which, which are wet. Uh, you can also use with the uh, after excision of OSSN, if it is was, you can do slit in the same setting and have a good outcome. So overall, wet eyes, non-inflamed surface. These are the best possible atmosphere for this, the cells to grow. Next is, when do we operate? In our, in our study on pediatric slit, what we found was from the duration between the chemical injury and slit, the average time was around six months. But the, all these were grade six burns. And the issue is in these grade six burns, in general, sometimes take three to uh, four months for the epithelium, for the surface to get epithelized, even if it's a conjunctival epithelium. So we need to wait. The timing is if preferably it has epithelized, the surface is epithelized, even if with the uh, conjunctival epithelium and the surface is uh, minimally inflamed. So now comes the surgery. So there are few steps. We'll straight away go on the uh, surgical video. So first step is taking limbal biopsy. These are the palisades that we want to harvest. Most important step, start with a superficial dissection, four to five mm. This, this conjunctiva will give you a handle and you must not touch the tenon. I'm cutting all the attachments of this superficial structure, the, uh, the conjunctiva, once I've reached the limbus, the bleeding shows that this is the posterior limbus. Now I'm using blunt size of 15 number blade. The end pointed, you should go in one to two millimeter into the clear cornea. So this is the uh, now dissected uh, limbal uh, biopsy dissection. 
so now first i'll cut the uh, conjunctival tissue which was actually helping me uh, as a handle and then limbal tissue uh, the uh, scissors should be flat and you should cut slowly the uh, and you should ensure that these palisades are very well preserved so once you have taken the limbal biopsy now the patient's uh, lscdi is draped first step is 360 degree peritomy need to cut off all the fibrous tissue this fibrous tissue is generally the uh, under the conjunctiva ensure that your globe is free is freely movable and there are no surface uh, no uh, fibrous tissue and then you come on the center and you can find this plane in the uh, for for cutting this uh, fibrovascular panis and once the whole thing is removed the whole panis is removed you place a wet uh, amniotic membrane uh, over this uh, surface this is a very important thing that because this amniotic membrane is going to provide a basement membrane over which these cells will grow so this is secured very well with the fibrin glue so what i am doing is i am securing first the upper half of the amniotic membrane then i'll secure the lower half so that the fibrin glue is very well Place. you need to be very comfortable with the fibrin glue so excess of amniotic membrane is cut or can be tucked under side over this the limbal biopsy pieces are uh, this strip is placed i am cutting it into multiple pieces try to keep the epithelial side up and it place it into the two rings one will be just inside the limbus and then the other ring will be mid periphery i'll avoid the center so center we should avoid so i'm using first the thick uh, part of the fibrin glue and then thin Uh, over it and then you all you have to do is just nudge these uh, explant just touch it so that the uh, ensure that the fibrin glow goes inside wait for good 8 to 10 minutes and then you can place a bandage contact lens and you can do a suture tarsiotomy as well sometimes this the inside the cornea after you have done the penis dissection you can see the cornea is absolutely clear and these are the patient who have a very good visual prognosis as well you can see and if you have done an amg during the acute phase removing this penis is extremely easy so uh, we learnt uh, a few things for limbal biopsy this was my first slit so you can see the donor site had a limbal stem cell deficiency and the reason for that is we went a bit deeper so i learned that you know you should not have a deeper dissection you should stay superficial and if you are staying superficial the later on you can't even make out what was a donor site and it heals pretty well and another thing that we have learned on the way is in the at least at least cases we could see some uh, uh, focal recurrences of lscd and these were managed very easily with cag or conjunctival autograft which told us or which we learned was it is not only the damage of the limbus it is the damage of the conjunctiva also that you have to take care of and what you can do is you can do the cag while you are doing your primary slit itself so you can see here 360 degree uh, peritomy and cutting off all the fibrous tissue and you know i'm ensuring that my globe can it can move all through so that there is no uh, uh, fibrosis left and then center area you can take while dissecting so i'm starting from here so i'm taking a cag as well as limbal biopsy so once i come here it will be only 3 mm so this this will be a large area so you can place it place a conjunctive uh, amg to cover it now the you can just cut these Uh, CAG into three pieces. You have to cover at least three to four millimeter just adjacent to the limbus. This part will be sutured with tenon uh, nylon, and the distal end can be secured with uh, uh, fibrin glue. So I have not placed the AMG yet. So I'm first securing the CAG tissue, and then I'll place a amniotic membrane over it, and then the same steps: amniotic membrane, and then later on these limbal biopsy uh, 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 pieces. So can we do slit oh, without AMG sir. as well? Uh, yes, if you have, you know, this is a once eighty degree limbal stem cell deficiency. But you can see that uh, you know this this tissue is the after penis is dissected, it is pretty smooth. So if you, it is pretty smooth, you can place these uh, explants directly without amniotic membrane. And this uh, cornea epithelium was pretty good, so I didn't want to touch it. You can see this, and the same patient you can see had a very good outcome. Uh, the tarsiotomy we do a lot of tarsiotomy if you have you know extensive lscd so after slit do a, a, a tarsiotomy as well post op steroids for 3 to 6 months depending upon the surface inflammation generally you need it for first 3 to 4 months lubricants you keep on going you check how is your bcl amg 
I remember this girl. This was, I think, uh, ten years old uh, photograph. So I could see this, you know, brownish-looking thing which was under the IMG, and I got scared that I've got an infection. So I made a cut, but actually it was just blood which had collected and drained off. Uh, uh, the patient did well, and this scar, this scar tends to faint over time. So the for the what Harsh had shown those patient, you know, you just wait. These these scars they tend to faint over time, and you can easily use RGB or scleral lenses. Rarely you can use. Uh, this is a very early patient, so we had done FALK. Patient did very well. You can do penetrating keratoplasty. You to be you need to be careful because chance of rejection will be high. But we have handful of patient who have undergone PK after slat and are doing pretty well. So overall, uh, if you just take care of pre-op, choose your patient well, choose your timing well, do a meticulous dissection, place your you know ensure that wherever the cunning device loss, place a CAG also. If you can do that, uh, take care of this. You'll surely have a You know, smiling slat patient and smiling surgeon. I would like to thank my mentor, Dr. Sangwan, from whom I have learned um, all this ocular surface uh, uh, stuff. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful talk, uh, Dr. Vikas. I think it answered any or all the doubts. Would uh, Namrata want to ask anything, or shall we go on to our last? No, it had. It was covered absolutely complete. Uh, Dr. Radhika, would you want to add something? I yes. think it was a very complete talk. Nice talk. It was covered all the aspects in a way with very practical suggestions and uh, good examples. If you've had a failure of uh, auto after an auto slit, when would you repeat it? So that's what. So generally, with failure, you generally tend to get a focal recurrences. So just see if the focal recurrence is small. All you can do is just place a CAG. That's it. And in case you have, you know, uh, over the limbus also, you can you 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 should wait wait for good. Uh, we generally wait for one year. You know, and then see if you if the center is clear with contact lens, vision is fine. No need to touch at all. But if if it is coming to the limbus, uh, to the center of the pupil, then yes, you might have to repeat. But if you repeat, ensure that you do a CAG as well, along with maybe you can do a mini slit. Important point while doing a repeat slit. So donor area, you should leave at least two clock hours and then take the you know next limbal biopsy piece. So it should not be adjacent. That's what you have to take care of. That was wonderful. Yes, wonderful. Uh, because just coming to my question, uh, do you, have you ever taken? Uh, yes, so so for yes, 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 yes. Because I there have, is no I other have. eye is not there. And, yes. So uh, in your will, yeah. in your patient, Harsh, I'll not do anything. So you said that patient can see something. So we'll try to give contact lenses. Maybe scler. So we have seen many a times. I'm sure Dr. Namta and Dr. Radhika would agree that you know once you for these uh, corneas, when you place a scleral contact lens, if the patient has one meter, he may see you know six six years six thirty six. The issue with taking very small area, you take it, you might land up into you know uh, uh, even more limbal stem cell deficiency. We had taken once. We had seen one patient, but the other eye was also bad. but there was one area you know from where we could take it so we just took very small piece and did it in case you feel that you'll have to do it that i think this is an indication for cleft and uh, slit should not be done, should not be done so you I take it do, you can grow. even do a cadaveric uh, slit if at all allo 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 slit from allo slit is a allo slit is a different ball game altogether allo yeah. slit means you have to be ready with you know immunosuppression, immunosuppression and all so yes yes that's right you can definitely do uh, it you will have to use immunosuppression with immunosuppression you can do it for sure what Thank is you. a preferred drug for uh, immunosuppression doctor because if you're doing a allo slit So allo slit that again depends what what drug you are comfortable with you can use mycophenolate plus azoran so what we generally do is in case we are doing allo slit we give you know ivmp maybe every month for you know 5 6 months and we give a combination of you know azoran or uh, uh, you can use uh, uh, this endoxan or mycophenolate so what i feel is we should be what we are comfortable with which drug we have used we should use only that drug so i i generally like azoran and you know with uh, systemic uh, uh, ivmp uh, intermittent shots i think that works pretty well for me but again we we have to be careful for when you are we are doing it using in a young patient so ensure that you know patient has you know completed his family all those things i think those things are very important thank you very much dr vikas so we shall go on to our last speaker dr shreya shamurthy who is a cataract cornea and refractive surgeon from the eye foundation group of hospitals and he is also going to take a tough topic now keratoconus processes should it or should it not be used for unilateral blindness So on to you, Shreyas. 
Uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you so much for having me over here. Uh, type one keratoprosthesis for unilateral corneal blindness. I mean, uh, to me, the statement itself sounds uh, scandalous. Uh, and a few years back, I think I wouldn't have even uh, thought twice about it. But in the last uh, decade or so, our understanding of keratoprosthesis, uh, the utility has changed and a lot of publication has come in. And uh, there is a certain perspective that we can bring into this topic today. Uh, before I go on to bring in a kind of a, a picture to this talk, I'll start with two case examples and then uh, take it forward. So the first was a patient, a 70 year old who had undergone three grafts earlier uh, and a fairly large graft. Uh, he was pseudophagic and presented with a failed graft, which was completely opaque and uh, with scarring. So you would not be able to uh, attempt an endothelial keratoplasty. Other I had 612 vision. The case, patient was keen on visual rehabilitation. So I did and uh, undertook the patient for a penetrating keratoplasty and a large graft. And uh, this was how the graft was. Uh, it was uh, initially was doing very well, uh, had uh, excellent gain in visual equity. And as you normally have in these large grafts, the astigmatism is so less and the patient was happy. But as you can see here, there was already a diffuse uh, uh, peripheral anterior sinicae, but the surface was healthy. And I knew sometime or the other, this graft is going to fail. And sure enough, this graft failed. And uh, because of the large graft, he also developed very dense vascularization. And, uh, you know, the surface kept breaking down because of uh, repeated bulle which formed. And uh, uh, again, there was a secondary graft infiltrate, which further uh, worsened the amount of vascularization. At this point of time, I was hesitant to do another PK in this patient. Uh, and after a lot of counseling and discussion, went ahead with a pseudophagic keratoprosthesis. So this was after the uh, uh, type 1 K-Pro. And uh, with, with a tarsoraphy, which I normally do in the early uh, post-operative period in all uh, keratoprosthesis patients. Sure enough, one year later, with the K-Pro in, in situ, as well as the peripheral anterior sinicae, which are already present, the patient developed glaucomatous optic neuropathy. And he had to undergo an, uh, a, a glaucoma drainage device. We did a oral lab aqueous drainage implant in this patient. And as you can see the tube here, this patient continued to do extremely well. And he's uh, six years post-op now, and he's maintaining 6-9 vision. His fields are stable thanks to the glaucoma drainage implant. And most importantly, he's on regular four-monthly follow-up and changes the BCL and maintains it very well. Second case, another patient who had undergone multiple grafts, now presented with early graft failure, but had high IOP and already had glaucomatous disc damage with diffuse PAS. Fellow I was 6'9 with thin ERM. While I was not keen on doing a graft immediately for this patient, at least to save the eye for any future visual rehabilitation, we encourage the patient to undergo a, a drainage implant, as you can see the tube here. And sure enough, uh, while the IOP did come under control, what happens commonly after uh, any of these drainage implants, uh, the graft failed and it was an opaque graft. And as you can see here, there was diffuse 360 degree peripheral anterior sinicae. So this was the second patient I had taken up at that time for a type 1 K-Pro in, uh, in the eye, even though the other eye was still a seeing eye. And five years post-op, this patient is on regular follow-up, does maintain stable vision with a stable surface. Both the patients already had a stable surface, no other uh, risk factor other than the fact that they had a high-risk graft and, of course, glaucoma. So the question is, in these situations, we can either do a high-risk graft or a type 1 K-Pro, or do nothing at all. And these would be the three options that we have. And comparing type 1 K-Pro versus repeat donor keratoplasty in this systematic review, we showed, and mind you, where they even included patients who had just undergone one graft earlier, not even patients with multiple grafts, with just even one graft earlier. But they found that there was a significantly better visual equity gain with 80% having better than 2200 versus 40% in the graft group. There was better retention and better clarity uh, at five years post-op with 75% retaining and having uh, a good vision at five years in the K-Pro group versus only 47% in the repeat graft group. And the progression of glaucoma was similar. While we always talk about complications with K-Pro and glaucoma being one of the most common uh, ones, uh, the progression between a high-risk graft and a K-Pro is uh, fairly similar. 
Now, looking into the literature itself for K-Pro in unilateral corneal blindness, now these are two uh, fairly large papers which have come out, one by Koskar et al. and another from Aldave's group, where they showed that it achieved similar visual acuity to that of the seeing eye with a K-Pro. The follow-up in both these studies averaged between 48 to 60 months. And as you would expect, retroprosthetic membrane and glaucoma were among the most common complications. But while they were dealt with at different points of time during the follow-up, uh, uh, 80, 82% uh, at the end of the follow-up retained the keratoprosthesis in patients with multiple failed grafts. Now, looking at KPRO, where you compare it with patients who have undergone unilateral versus bilateral corneal blindness, and this was an important study which looked at a cohort where they had unilateral corneal blindness of KPRO in that eye and bilateral corneal blindness with KPRO in one eye. They found that there were similar visual outcomes in the eye with the KPRO which was implanted and the complication rates and device retention rates were fairly similar. This is another important study which uh, uh, came out of uh, uh, Mass Eye and Ear, where they divided into two groups where patient who had uh, a bilateral blindness were in less than 2200 in the seeing eye and had undergone KPRO and the other group which had good vision and had undergone KPRO in the contralateral eye. They found that while the initial visual outcome was similar, the complications were more in patients who had good vision in the fellow eye. And they also found that it was possibly because at least they attributed it to the fact that possibly these patients were less cautious, dropped out of follow-ups, did not come regularly for follow-ups, and generally tended to present late when there was a drop in vision, which did not happen in patients who had poor vision already in the contralateral eye. Now, the points in favor of KPRO are that yeah, the other choice being if you have to visually rehabilitate the patient is a high risk graft. We know the survival rate is poor. And with these highly vascularized grafts, it's almost like a solid organ transplant. And if you want the graft to survive, you have to put them on systemic immunosuppression. But with a patient with a good fellow seeing eye, the risks of uh, systemic immunosuppression outweigh the benefits. And again, with the KPRO, with better techniques now, better material with uh, titanium backplate, which uh, reduces the rate of uh, retroprosthetic membranes, and our better knowledge on how to handle complications, the follow-up required, the uh, bandage contact lenses, etc., has definitely lowered the frequency of uh, complications in well-chosen cases. There are, there's also been a couple of studies which have looked at the quality of life and the binocular visual function in patients who have undergone Boston type 1 K-Pro with the other eye uh, which is uh, seen. And they found uh, that it does restore binocular vision to some extent. The patients have a better visual field, improved motor skills and patient safety and quality of life. And importantly, it had lower anisometropia in comparison to uh, a normally uh, than, uh, where the other eye has undergone a graft. Obviously, the uh, incidence of high astigmatism is certainly lower in a patient with a keratoprosthesis. So this also gave useful binocular vision to the patient uh, without glasses or contact lenses. So the points against KPRO, and I cannot emphasize this enough, points against KPRO in unilateral corneal blindness is that the primary indication of KPRO when it started was for bilateral corneal blindness, and this is not without reason. Because there is a significant risk of losing that eye altogether with a keratoprosthesis. Whether it is because of uh, a retroprosthetic membrane uh, leads to subsequent uh, recurrent melts, uh, uh, glaucoma, which is not, which has not been treated adequately with a glaucoma drainage device, uh, a repeated incidence of vitritis, which is common in uh, KPRO patients, and of course, a higher incidence of retinal detachment. So there is a greater risk of losing the eye altogether. But again, uh, papers have shown that while KPRO is being done in extreme eyes, where it is a last ditch effort to bring back vision, it is important that we prognosticate based on the primary condition. Wherever it has been done, where there are not multiple risk factors, like in a uh, failed graft or even in some cases of aniridia, the long-term outcomes and retention rates have been much better than in patients with a, a high-risk graft, limbal stem cell deficiency, uh, poor blink rate, neurotrophy, all the other risk factors which actually uh, can uh, further increase the uh, risks which are there with a the type 1 care of the process. So to conclude, uh, careful case selection is extremely important. 
pre op counseling explaining the patient for lifelong meticulous follow up uh, the risks that they are going to entail by having uh, undergoing a kpro the risk of even losing uh, vision completely in that eye or losing that eye itself although if on regular follow up even if there is a melt we can do uh, tectonic pks and save that eye again for a potential repeat kpro or even replace the device with another kpro but all of this can be done only if the patient is on meticulous kpro and of course understanding the underlying causative factors handling post op complications especially glaucoma with adequate uh, drainage devices in a timely manner is extremely important uh, whenever we are considering this in such a situation thank you so much for your kind attention i look forward to the views of the extinct uh, panelists thanks shreyesh that was a difficult talk and uh, very well managed and uh, i look forward to hearing from namrata mal radhika dr amma any questions i think dr radhika will comment first i would like to uh, compliment shreyas because he has uh, nicely covered all the angles and has highlighted absolutely all the required points uh, and uh, is also important to um, you know gauge how much the patient and the family is understood because we say and as but sometimes they don't absorb or internalize their implications so that's important and um, yes i do agree that um, it's not uh, the way when kpro first started it was absolutely like an end stage procedure for as a last option and for bilaterally blind there are a certain patients who are really keen on having vision in that eye they've had multiple graft failures and as long as they understand that you know it's um, all the complications which you mentioned it's not something that you definitely will say no it cannot be done etc um th th there is one thing to explain also about the cost because um, they it, it it requires kind of about an additional 1000 to 1500 rupees every month um and the follow up is absolutely important so that's something which uh, needs to be emphasized and the quality of and knowledge has improved so much the devices have improved so much so um it's definitely an option which uh, has to be kept in mind which which can be offered and um, uh, you you can have patients as you showed with 6 to 7 to 8 years of good vision um and they, generally i find that people who have somebody who can care for them i mean it's the people who are non eyed who are absolutely alone have no help with the eye drops no help reaching in time they are the ones who then who really need it and then the ones who actually suffer from the procedure the ones who have a caring family or they have ability of somebody to take care of them bring them quickly they they literally have to report within 24 to 48 hours of developing a problem and um, so case careful case selection and your own commitment uh, to the follow up that's very very much uh, an important aspect does it make sense to have a, a, a glaucoma drainage device put at the same time as kpro or one very complicated surgery and combining it with another makes no sense no it's not necessary that it makes no sense uh, uh, definitely if the patient uh, require has had multiple grafts has uncontrolled glaucoma and uh, if tube shunt is required you can do it in the same setting um, you can do it as a stage procedure also uh, uh, depending upon the case but if necessary you can do it in one setting because the, the that way the surgery is very forgiving the, the type 1 boston k pro it doesn't matter you know uh, uh, what is the status of um, because the cornea the the whole the host cornea or the rest of the cornea if it becomes very hazy doesn't matter because it's the 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 central optic which is going to give you the the, the clear vision um the the problem with the if you are putting a glaucoma drainage device and one should put a valve device because without a valve there is a risk of endophthalmitis that increases and um, so yeah you, you need to have a whole team Uh, either you do it yourself that you put the glaucoma drainage tube yourself or you have a glaucoma team and then uh, you as well, you know the cornea team and sometimes retina team as well yeah yes yeah. any any other questions before we conclude if i may add just one point on that yeah. uh, also i mean the uh, the timing of the glaucoma drainage device is also important especially as madam mentioned if we are using a non valve device it is going to take 6 uh, to 8 weeks for iop to come down 
and this is a window of time when uh, you know we can potentially lose the eye to glaucoma uh, because of high iop and uh, there have been times where even orphan trab has been done we know that the trab is going to fail but it's just that the trab works for that 4 to 6 weeks till this uh, takes place this is especially for patients from our part of the world who don't can't afford uh, a, a little more expensive ahmed valve and the rd is uh, definitely at 1 1/10 the cost and uh, we are able to offer it at a much lower price yeah yes very well covered so i think uh, it goes without saying i'm sure all of you would agree with me that's been an amazing webinar and there has been so much of learning in every topic so beautifully dealt and i think truly kudos to the uh, speakers and the expert panel for ensuring that the all the right answers were given and we actually end this webinar with a whole lot of uh, information is just that you wish your gray matter holds on to all this information instead of <laughs> letting some of it go off with a period of time so thanks a lot expert panel thanks a lot dear speakers were just wonderful and i'm truly thankful to dr rajesh fogla who actually stepped in because dr rishi couldn't join and he really manned the earlier part of the webinar so beautifully well along uh, along and uh, my thanks are due to the uh, mr kripal and the ars admin team for their being constantly uh, supportive and encouraging for all these webinars and i think actually i should thank dr namrata sharma primarily for being so very supportive to ensure that irc webinars do happen in the regularity in which it is happening my thanks are due to sai and uh, manjula from numerotech for all the uh, mails they keep shooting to your inboxes which i'm sure keeps you all updated to see it on the day of the webinar or probably later too because i'm sure the rc web website is very actively being used and our thanks are very much due to mr anand and his entire team for how meticulously they time it and how gently they remind us and it's an amazing group which has helped us run these webinars well our thanks are uh, so very much due to entod because uh, they have been our constant sponsors and such a source of encouragement that we are able to reach out to all the attendees in a timely manner and thanks a lot dear attendees for being there as a constant encouraging factor for us to keep coming back to you all with more webinars thank you one and all of you we want to thank you chitra for doing these excellent webinars week after week tirelessly and with such enthusiasm and collecting all the best speakers in the country on the same platform So, yes, I would also like kudos to, to you. Yeah, kudos yeah, to you. I appreciate your uh, comments and you know your way you handled the mm -hmm. uh, discussions and all was really very very nice. Thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you so much. I mean, yeah, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank bye you. bye. Thank Have you. a bye. Bye. Kitra's uh, program gets made six months before actually. <laughs> She's so <Wow>. organized <laughs> and so meticulous. <laughs>